On Tuesday, August 23rd, 2022, Tennessee Highway Patrol Sergeant Lee Russell and Marion County Sheriff's Office Detective Matt Blanson tragically lost their lives when the helicopter they were flying in came down in a heavily wooded area of Marion County, Tennessee. Some of you may remember that I call Tennessee home, and over the years it has been my distinct privilege to spend time with the troopers assigned to the Tennessee Highway Patrol Aviation Section. I had the chance to fly with Lee more than once, and I will never forget his smile, his quick wit, and the love that he felt for his young family. I dedicate this project to the memories of two heroes, Sergeant Lee Russell and Detective Matt Blancett. May we never forget them, nor the men and women of law enforcement like them, who stand the watch every day to keep us safe. Welcome to Safe on Deck. Episode 24 is part one of my interview with Senior Chief Chris Massacott. Chris joined the Navy in May of 1999 and trained as an avionics technician aboard Naval Air Station Pensacola and Naval Air Station Oceana. Chris spent much of his career at sea on six different operational deployments, including Operation Enduring Freedom, Operation Iraqi Freedom, Operation Anaconda, Operation New Dawn, and Operation Tomodachi. Throughout his career, Chris was stationed across the United States on assignments to AIMD Fallon, the USS John C. Stennis, seen at U Jacksonville, Naval Air Station Pensacola, and as a member of VFA-154, Black Knights, and VAQ-132, the Scorpions. For his final tour in the Navy, Chris was selected to join the Blue Angels, where he served in the position of Quality Assurance Supervisor and Maintenance Control Supervisor for three years before being detailed to serve on the Legacy to Super Hornet transition team. Chris retired from the Navy in 2021 as an avionics, electrician, technician, senior chief with over 22 years of distinguished service. Thanks for taking the time to listen. In the future, I plan to continue to share similar interviews with both current and retired military aviators. If you have a question or suggestion for a future interview, please leave it as a comment below. Safe on Deck, Episode 24, Part 1 with Senior Chief Chris Massacott. Enjoy. You have family in the military. What kind of pushed you toward? I, I did. The Navy? So, um, you know, my dad was in the Navy. He was a uh, pilot. Uh, went to the Naval Academy. Okay. So out of high school. So uh, did four years in the Naval Academy. Was uh, selected as a pilot and did. Uh, I, I'm not sure exactly all he trained. I know he's talked about uh, Meridian, and uh, but he was a A7 pilot. So wow. yep, yeah, no slack and light attack. You know, it's their motto. You know, and yep. uh, he also talks about you know the uh, single. Uh, single engine on a carrier kind of being you know uh using that as a buffing up against other people you know uh, oh, for sure because yeah. i'm sure in the uh the, the folks will follow you gotta you know uh assert your dominance so yes. he's got a lot of interesting stories but uh my parents divorced when i was uh, about 14 13 14 something like that so right in those like formative years i guess you know right when it uh trying to figure out who i am trying to figure out what life is and whatnot and uh I don't think my dad, myself, anybody in my family really thought the military was ever going to be something for me. So I moved down with my mom to Fort Wallen Beach, Florida, just right around the corner here. That's right. I remember this. this. And uh, got into a lot of trouble. Um, I, I'll show you my driver's license one time from, from that era. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty funny. But uh, I broke as many laws as I could possibly get away with. I'm so thankful there's no social media or, uh, you know, uh, digital uh, video back then. No recording like this. No yeah. recording, right, because <laughs> I'm sure, uh, I don't know, Statue of Limitations is up. But anyway, I um, got to a point where I, I hit, like, complete rock bottom. And uh, <clears throat> there was a situation that arose where uh, I, I basically called my dad and said, I need to go and live with him. And he was like, no, I'm not uh, going to let you live here. Cause you know, you just, you, you know, kind of how far gone you are and I'm not, you know? And so I said, well, I'm joining the Navy. So I joined wow. the Navy, uh, went into the recruiter's office, uh, like two days after that. Um, I was bloodied and bruised. I actually got into a fight with my roommate is what had ended up happening. And, um, it was pretty, it was pretty nasty. You know, my, so I think that's where my nose got rearranged because I actually had some nasal issues that were just recently uh, uncovered. And, uh, you know, um, I think that's what, what ended up happening because I was, like, put face first into a toilet. So Oh, gosh. Wow. Yeah, not a, not a fun time. But, not uh, at all. You know, it's, it's, it's what shaped me and uh, what drove me to the Navy. So I was uh, able to, you know, lead on my dad for a lot of advice. And, you know, obviously I'd, I'd – I'd always wanted to be a pilot, you know, I always kind of, I, I just, 
you know, loved aviation. Um, I can remember, you know, following the Blue Angels for as far as I can think back. And um, I, I, I'm pretty sure I've done the dates and, and married everything up. I was at the last air show that the Blue Angels did in China Lake back in the early 90s because my dad was stationed there. And then when I was on the team uh, in 2017, our show right after El Centro was the Blue Angel uh, China Lake Air Show, which was the first time they had been there in, you know, it's like 20 some odd years. And wow. so, like, yeah. I was at that last one they were there, and then I was, you know, back as a senior chief on the team. So I thought that was pretty cool. So Absolutely. That's incredible. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just aviation's always been something that I was interested in, and luckily my dad steered me towards, you know, hey, if you're going to join the Navy, they're going to tell you, you, you know, oh, you, you might be a nuke. You could do this. You could do that. He said, make sure you get a guarantee in something aviation. So... Uh, I'm glad he let me know that because there was a lot of people that were promised one thing and then, you know, got re-rated into something else in boot camp. But luckily I was uh, able to maintain uh, avionics. So I was an, okay. a, an AT by trade is what what it, I ended up being uh, when I joined. And I did six months of uh, A school here in Pensacola uh, doing I-level. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, Absolutely. like intermediate yeah. level uh, maintenance. So a lot of circuit theory back then. You know, uh, it's, it's a little bit um, – because – AMD is now more O to D. There's there's no, there's a lot less I in 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 uh, the naval aviation uh, maintenance kind of evolution. They're they're getting away from a lot of uh, I level support. Um, really? Yeah. There's um, like I think the uh, F thirty five has a lot of just O to D stuff. You know, just there's really it does never go to a AMD for repair. And the bench maintenance on like casts and whatnot. I mean, they're they're really trying to whittle that stuff down. Okay. Um, so, uh, and even the the eye level techs that you have, they're not really getting that component level repair stuff because even if they do have repair capability, they're replacing a card. Where I was taught to go all the way down to the transistor or the IC chip or the resistor. So. Uh, I had a lot of specialized training in that, so that's incredible. That's yeah. a really kind of a lost art. It sounds like it, it is. So I was actually an IFF technician. Um, so the IFF system is a lot of just uh, pulse shaping, and you know, and there's a lot of just transistors and logic gates, and and you know, the the older IFF systems like your APX72, uh, your APX76, which was an interrogator. Um, you know, there there was a fine art to uh, getting those things all tuned in and dialed in properly. A lot of like, you know, manipulation of O-scopes and, you know, pulse counters and, and, and doing a lot of just fine tuning through potentiometers. And, you know, now it's pretty much just replace this card and, yeah. you know, and just move on. So it seems to be the overall philosophy, not even just so much in the military, but just in civilian life, remove and replace. At least in the 53 from my background. Yes. I remember our RAEs and RATs could go anywhere in the fleet and be just fine because if they could work on a 53, Mm -hmm. We were the last of that line. I, well, I don't want to say the last of that line, but certainly the last fleet platform out there that had steam gauges, that did not have glass cockpits, that did sure. not have a lot of that. Yeah, you saw that when I was up in Whidbey because you had the EA6B uh, technicians, and then they're going to the Growler, which was, uh, you know, it, it's it's kind of like night and day almost, you know, when you're really having to do a lot of wire troubleshooting. And, you know, there's, there's really a, a, an in-depth knowledge of the airplane where, you know, on a, a Growler, can troubleshoot itself for a, for a lot of the things you know it has msp codes that it spits out so those maintenance codes uh allow you to kind of at least get into the ballpark of what's going on uh all the data that comes off the maintenance card um you know the the boeing engineers and and the tech reps that they have they're able to kind of look into the the data that's that's being provided through those cards and and actually look at like valve positions and switch positions and you know help you troubleshoot um a lot more so you, you rely heavily on the on the uh, technology that's available, and and I think it and it makes a not as a stronger technician to to Agreed. troubleshoot. So great, and I know nothing about that. Just to be clear, I'm I'm relying on your your word and that of others that I know in the uh, a lot of what I obviously know general aviation side of it. Right, it's a tremendous learning curve, and you know, yeah, someone's an A and P, but. Do they have experience in your airplane in that specific, you know, Garmin Suite versus Aspen right. Avionics? And the more I learn about A&P, I'm, I'm kind of blown away. You know, they're yeah. just, you know, you get like a very overarching, uh, you know, set of uh, skill sets that you're tested on and whatnot. And, you know, it's it's very broad and, and you're yes. kind of a jack of all trades. And then, like you say, I mean, like, do you have uh, you know experience on this? It's like, no, but I have the manuals and I can figure it out. And, 
And then once all that's done, as an AMP, they're signing their own stuff off in accordance with this manual. It's it's uh, it's a little bit uh, as as having 22 years of, of naval aviation where it's like you don't do anything without a CDI. Someone is always behind you to uh, ensure you're doing it properly. It was kind of like a step back of like, whoa, that's really how it's done. But that's And that's really the right way to done. do it. I truly believe that. Even when my, my brother and I are working on our airplane, I'll jokingly say, okay, you do the work. I'll be QA. QA, sure. I'm big air quotes here. We're, neither of us, let's say an oil change. I'm not an A&P. I know what to look for. I kind of put a flash HUD on things. You know, all tools right. accounted for. Bring some of that philosophy over to general aviation. And he'll chuckle at me, and then later he'll say, oh, yeah, that's why we caught that, or that's why right. I missed that. A second set of eyes is, you know, you, there's a lot of uh, accident uh, reviews that you can look at, and, you know, it's like a maintenance hiccup that wasn't caught on a pre-flight or whatnot, and, it, you know, like something as easy as a trim tab. I, I was reading an accident report of uh, a trim tab that basically was installed upside down or was rigged upside down, so basically when you're trimming up, it's trimming down, and, you know, uh, put basically put an airplane in the dirt, you know, yep. so uh, that's a big deal, you know, and. Uh, just little things to look for on on a pre-flight, even though it's been you know through an AMP and then was it AMPI or you know the inspector. Uh, IA. Uh, IA. Yeah, there you go. IA. Yeah. Yep. Trust but verify. Uh, right. Works in naval aviation. Works in real life too. So. Yep. Cool. So let's go back. So I uh, talked about A school here. A school here. Where'd you go after Pensacola? Uh, after Pensacola was up to Oceana for a C school. That's where I went to my IFF uh, C school. Um, and did uh, about three months in in Oceana. So really just a blip on the radar for. Um, for that purpose as, as far as it was just for that school. Um, and then off to uh, Fallon, Nevada was my first uh, oh my. station. Out so in the desert. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, you know, it's funny. I, there wasn't as many, uh, you know, there wasn't apps and stuff you could look up and I, and I, in my head, I thought it was closer to Vegas. And so I was like, Oh, Fallon, Nevada, you know, I'll, I'll go to Vegas every weekend and whatnot. And I, what I realized that it, it is like the next town up from Vegas, but it's like six hours in between. So, Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's quite a hike. It, the good news is uh, there's de- you know open desert for miles, and you can see. So there's no place for a cop to hide. So I, I think the highest uh, my friend's Honda got up to was like 105 going to going to Vegas one one weekend. But you know, airman stories. Absolutely. I was going to say, yeah, I'm sure there's plenty of those. Yeah, but uh, Fallon was definitely um, it. You know, everybody complains about Fallon, and, and it is what it is. I've always believed that you know every place that you go. Uh, there, there's good and bad, right? So I always try to find the good. Uh, a lot of, you know, it's kind of like Lemoore. Uh, there's a lot to do uh, locally, if or not locally, but, you know, if you get out of the local uh, area, you know, there's um, Sand Mountain, there's uh, fishing, there's Reno Tahoe, there's, you know, there was a lot of stuff to do around there. So, um, and, and from a military or just a, you know, a development standpoint in my career, it was awesome because it was me as Airman Massacott and then my LPO who was a first class. So guess what I did? Everything. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Everything. Yeah, yeah. So I learned about calibration. I learned about Emerald. I learned about all, you know, just every program that the, that you have in the Navy that is under the, the NAMP, I learned because it was like, I'm not doing this. You're doing it. And, you know, although I might have had some choice words at the time, I look back and go, man, I learned so much, you know, so as uh, I only I did about a year and nine months. I was there uh, during I was there for September 11th. So and I had orders already to the USS uh, John C. Stennis and um, was due to go there in February, which would have put me at my natural rotation. But I ended up leaving uh, around December and getting out to the Stennis early because they deployed early uh, in support of, uh, you know, the it was Operation uh, Enduring Freedom. And then uh, we were a part of Operation Anaconda. Um, so went out, uh, like three months, I, I cut my shore tour three months early to get, to get out there. So was that a common thing? I, I was a, uh, middle school student, I think back then, but I do remember a very strong sense of patriotism, uh, in the country. Oh, was it people wanted to, yeah, cut me loose, get me, get me on a boat, get me over in Absolutely. the part of the world. Okay. And yeah, def- definitely a, a lot different, um, uh, theme, I guess, in, in the, yeah. in the country. I mean, there was flags everywhere and we were, you know, kind of, uh, united as one and it was, you know, you don't mess with the USA and, um, you know, it was just a very different kind of dynamic than what you kind of feel today, you know, kind of, yeah. um, and yeah, it was just, it, it's still looking back, uh, it, that's like one of those days you'll, you'll never forget where you were at and how the, the whole thing went down. I so mean, where, where were you? Yeah. That's my question. Well, I was, so obviously in Fallon, you know, it's th- uh, New York three hours ahead. So everything was going down right about the time I was getting ready to go to work. And, uh, 
uh, you know, and I didn't, you don't have cell phones. You didn't have, you know, I wasn't turning on the TV in the mornings. You know, you didn't, you weren't as connected. You weren't getting the notifications at the time. So I had no idea any of this was going on. So the first inkling that I had of anything going on was when I, when I got in my car to make the drive over to, to work and I got into the car and, uh, it, it was just after the first plane hit the, the building and, uh, there was a new radio station on the rock station I listened to there and they, they, they had a new kind of format in the morning and they were like one of those, uh, slapsticky kind of, you know, uh, and, and they were always doing like crazy, you know, things on the radio. So, I mean, I, I was like, is this real? You know, they're talking about a plane hitting the building. Is this just kind of, you know, and they were, you know, they were kind of being their slapsticky selves, you know, and I think, you know, the, the whole tenor of everybody was, uh, you know, this was like some fluke accident, you know, nothing, uh, like, what's, what's, uh, what's this all about? Nobody really had any idea. This was like a terrorist attack, you know? So, and I was just kind of like, I, I didn't know if they were joking. I didn't know if this was real because how their demeanor was. So obviously it's a short drive anywhere in Fallon, uh, on base. So I was like, you know, took the, the two minute drive over to, to work and I go into work. And, uh, at, at some point after our production meeting or whatnot, the second plane had hit. And like, that's when everybody, like everything just stopped, you know, it was like, Hey, uh, like nobody was worried about production. No one was worried about anything. It was just, everybody was glued to a TV. And my dad, um, was a, uh, airline pilot, uh, at the time he was flying for Southwest. So he had retired out of the Navy and, uh, was hired with Southwest. So I immediately called him like, you know, Hey, cause I didn't know if he was flying or not. So luckily he was, uh, not on a trip that, that day. Uh, so he was home safe and it was just kind of like, what gives, you know, so what, what is going on here? And uh, it took a while for everybody to kind of process that this was, you know, like we are under attack, like this is a coordinated effort at this point. And then, uh, I was on the phone with my dad when, when the first tower fell and I, and, uh, I guess he was, uh, had a feed like ahead of mine, you know, just for whatever reason. And he's like, Oh, it's, it's falling, it's falling. And I was like, what? And then it, it caught up and, you know, just see the, just the, this tower just crump, you know, the world trade center. Cause I had actually been in the trade center when I was real little. Um, my, my grandparents lived in Connecticut and we went to New York city and, and did a tour of the statue of Liberty and the world trade center. And I mean, I can just remember, obviously I was, I was little, so everything's massive, but you know, it's just a massive building coming down in the middle of, you know, one of our biggest populated uh, cities in, in the United States. It was just, uh, like, you know, your heart sank, you know, it just, uh, and so, man, you think back to that and it's, it's like just days upon days of people just glued to the TV, just rewatching things. And just like, nobody could really put the, you know, put the words together as, as to what this truly all meant. You know, it was just very, uh, surreal, you know, and then obviously being on base, they activated ASF. And so my buddy had to do 12 hour watches and the, and the, the security out the gate. Have you, you've been to Fallon. I, I take I'm not, no, 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 I'm not. Okay. <laughs> haven't had the, haven't had the pleasure yet. Well, um, for those that have been to Fallon, they'll kind of understand there's like this long, long, long road that runs down, like pretty much uh, parallels the base. And then, uh, you get to the end of that road and then it takes you out to town. And I just remember, you know, my barracks kind of overlooked that road. And the next day, I mean, traffic was backed up all the way to, you know, they said it basically went to that, uh, that where the, where it turned into to town, which was probably, you know, two, three miles, I think is that stretch. Um, you know, and just, so we're, we were like on complete lockdown, uh, uh, still picking through the pieces of what does this mean? You know, everybody's, you know, I, I'm, I'm on shore duty or are we getting activated? Are we, you know, can we cut orders short? Everybody's, you know, wanting to pick through, like, how does, what does this mean? Like, you know, and everybody wanted answers as to like, you know, uh, are we going to war and who are we going to war with? And what, you know, it was just, um, just a lot of just confusion and anger and, and just, um, it, yeah, it was a very, uh, just interesting time. You know, it's just, of course, um, so after that, you said headed to the boat? I did. What so, was that deployment like? Um, well, obviously it was, uh, you know, had had very specific purpose and a very specific, uh, you know, I, I, j- just getting to the, the ship was uh, was quite the adventure because it, it, it had already left and was on deployment. And um, so um, I'd gotten all my things packed up and got them situated. And uh, from Fallon, uh, the ship was home ported in San Diego. So... They basically, I, I drove down and my dad lived in Oceanside, California, just outside of San Diego. So uh, I took a couple of days of leave, got all my, my affairs in order and everything, got everything ready. And then I, I time traveled because I have no idea. I boarded an airplane 
uh, in San Diego. I don't really remember what time. And then I don't know if it was days, hours. I have no idea, but uh, ended up on the, the John C. Stennis. So I, I went from San Diego to uh, Norfolk, caught the rotator that leaves Norfolk, yep. stops in the Azores for gas. Pretty sure we uh, stopped at, uh, I think it was either Suda Bay or uh, Naples. I think one, either one of those two. And then uh, I, I, I think it was Naples and then Suda Bay and then on to uh, Bahrain. And um, we landed in Bahrain. And again, like I said, I have no idea because you're, cha- you know, so many time zones. I have no concept of time through that. And then um, we got to Bahrain and they were like, well, I, we don't think we're going to be able to get you out to the, the ship, and we don't know how long it's it's been. And, and so basically you guys are going to go to the barracks over here and check into barrack support. You muster every day and, you know, strip and wax floors. And, you know, and I'm, I was kind of just like, you know, I've got, my, I've got like my sea bag, and, you know, I'm just like I'm ready just to, to get to the ship and get settled. And, you know, this is like never been to the ship, never, you know, it's, it's just all new and exciting. And I'm like, I do not want to stop and unpack my sea bag and repack it. So – I was kind of hanging out the with the uh, OIC that was kind of in charge of our little uh, debt getting out there. And uh, they were like, hey, there's a cod, and it's got like two spots left. And I was like, pick me, pick me, pick me. He's like, are you serious? You know? And I'm like, yeah, send me. I, I, I just don't – I, I want to get there. So um, they, they threw they, – I was able to get that spot. So I, I caught it aboard. And, uh, what was that like? Had, um, you, had you flown in the cod before? No, no, that was my first time. So um, – it was interesting to stay the least. I know um, when they when they got the engines online and you know the the uh, locks was getting pumped in and whatnot. There was like this uh, you know kind of like this fog of of the and you know there was people freaking out thinking there was smoke and you know uh, the one of the air crewmen was like you know kind of wafting it up to him and smelling it and he kind of was like giving some weird looks and then he was like giving a thumbs up and people were kind of like oh my goodness um, but yeah just a loud noisy rough ride out there but. Uh, uh, you, there was no kind of windows, whatnot. So you're just kind of in this thing, just going along. And then, uh, it's not like they have like an announcement system of like, you know, Hey, we're making our final approach to the USS John C. Stennis, uh, you know, please. So it's just like, all of a sudden they're yelling like, Hey, 10 seconds, you know, and you're like 10 seconds and then, you know, and feet are flying up in the air and it was a pretty rough ride, but I, you know, definitely a, an interesting experience. And then I'm not trying to date you. That'd be a C2A, probably. Probably a C2A. Yeah. I, at the time, I, I'm yeah. sure it was uh, awesome. So, you know, it rolls over into the six pack and it opens up. And um, you know, I left at night and it was like bright daylight out. So uh, again, don't know how many hours everything uh, all this was. Getting the you know myself situated. My eyes are, are trying to adjust and you know get someone's yelling go this way go this way follow that guy you know run over to, to flight deck control there and then you know right by flight deck control is uh the ato office which is the air transit office so it's, it's typically right like kind of by the island and that's where they have everybody kind of like uh held and you know for anybody that's going or anybody that's coming they, they process you through the ato so i had caught everybody by surprise so uh they knew I was coming, but they didn't know that I was going to be on that cod. So they called down to AIMD, and they're like, "Hey, we got you know Airman Mascot here," and they're just like, "What?" Actually, I, I, I tell you, it was I was AT three Mascot, so okay. I was moving up in the world. Yeah, so. absolutely. Um, so uh, my my shop LPO comes up and he's like, "Well, what the hell are you doing here?" You know, it's like, "Well, I'm here." So uh, they they took me down to my my rack, and uh, they were like, you know, just sleep figure it out because I, t- I was like i have no idea what day it is i don't know anything uh the stennis when you're ship's company the first like week and a half you go to the training department so they give it everybody into the training department they do all your uh in dock they do all your kind of like uh basic dc kind of uh stuff give you just the lay of the land so you're, you're basically attached to the training department so they're like you know you're here early no one knew you're here just just go and sleep and so i, I you know fe- Put me in my rack. I went and I took a shower and I, I, I went back to my rack and I slept for I don't know how long, but I, I got woken up by them doing no loads on the uh, the cats because I was up in the forward berthing. And uh, again, something you've probably never experienced. I've not, no. <laughs> when, they, when, when, when that catapult goes, it is, I'm, 
and when you're not used to it, it, I mean, the whole ship shakes. It is loud. I mean, I, I literally jumped out of my rack, and there was a little uh, lounge area in the birthing. There were some people there. And I'm looking around, and I was like, what is that? Are we under attack? And they're just laughing. They're like, what are you talking about? I was like, what was that? And they're like, they're just shooting olos, man. We're about to do flight ops. And I, I, I mean, I was like so discombobulated because, I mean, I don't know if that was a two-hour nap that I had taken or a 10-hour nap. But um, it was funny because they told me, don't worry about it. But then uh, at some point, someone came and knocked, and they're like, hey, man, you need to get up and get down to training. Like, you know, and so I was like, okay, well, I don't – what time is it, whatever. So um, apparently I would slept for like almost a day and a half. Um, so – but I was well-rested and went down to the training and did, did my thing and then got up to the to the shop that I was working in. And uh, it was it – was, uh, the shop that I was in, uh, 65 Golf, it was the IATS test bench. It, they essentially built the, the Hornet and built this test bench alongside with it. So – the, the bench itself simulated uh, a Hornet. So it ran up all like the signal data computers and the SMS computers. And, and all. so basically any avionic that was not ComNav was ran up on this bench. So, um, and then, you know, for the time frame, and we were pretty much all Hornet. There was, there was one F-14 squadron and then there was three F-18 squadrons. And uh, then S three, we still had S threes back then. So you're supporting <laughs> the entire the, the entire I'm, air wing. Well, I was I w- we were in AIMD, but my my bench specifically my my work center was all was the F 18s okay. which were the primary uh, uh, aircraft going in and dropping bombs. I think they were putting bombs at the time on the F 14s They did very have, new to that platform, very, right? Yeah. Uh, but the the primary uh, bomb droppers basically were the, was the F eighteen. So. And it's going to be legacy jets of some flight legacy with Look, big air quotes, but Alphas, Charlies. It was Alphas and Charlies, um, but I know there was definitely low lot um, uh, aircraft. So the Marines always have more money for uh, airplanes, uh, just because they're a smaller branch. And sure. So the Marines had all the the latest. Uh, if anybody knows anything about the F eighteen, they have like the night attack versions of stuff. So the the, the very first F 18s were just you know the F 18s, and then they went to this night attack, which had um, you know uh, they had a dimming switch, and all the displays would go to this uh, like uh, NVG green and, and whatnot. So. Um, we had pretty much every uh, type of legacy on there because the Marines had the very advanced uh, avionics for its day, and some of the the Navy squadrons had like the the horizontal situation indicator for the uh, Hornet. The very first versions of it was a map reel. It actually had a, a map reel in it, and uh, you would have to load the map in, and it would you know whenever you would uh, like try to go somewhere, it would like. <laughs> And then it would lock to where it was, and you could scroll around. And when you were running these things up, you'd have to run the map reel all the way back and forward. And then it would go to actually there was EPs, emergency procedures that were on the the back end of it, and you'd have to make sure that it could scroll through and you could read everything. And you know they they were a pain because it was all just like these synchros to that you would have to adjust to uh, uh, get the things in. And you would get everything in in the front, and then it would wheel all the way to the back, and then it would start to like shake and so you'd like you know take all the little servos and synchros and and it would you would get it from stop shaking and it would move around slew like it's supposed to and then you'd reel it back to the front and it would start to shake so i mean it, it was just a fine balance of trying to get all that stuff uh situated so just a lot of aligning and adjusting on that okay. stuff a lot of aligning and adjusting but since we were primarily uh Hornets were the, were the main workhorse of that deployment. Uh, our shop was busy. In, in one 12-hour shift, we had like 30 gear, 30 pieces of gear inducted uh, that we would have to run up. And so a lot of, a lot of cannibalization, a lot of, uh, you know, just, hey, take this, make this work, you know, you know get this uh, going. I mean, we we're trying to RFI as much, you know, uh, should I be using all these acronyms? Well, no, no. Maybe? And I was going to say, if you, if you want to explain them, awesome. If not, if you, folks can always Google them or look sure. them up. I, I'm I do a lot, lot of that myself. I'm yeah. using a lot of Navy terminology. So. <laughs> That's the goal, when right? You, when, you, uh, yeah, when you're working at an, a, an intermediate facility, you yep. RFI the gear, which is ready for issue, meaning it can be issued to the squadron. But a lot of the gear that we were getting was uh, XREP, which is expeditious repair, which means that's the only one. So you, you're basically keeping an aircraft down. Uh, because of uh, because of uh, that piece of gear that's inducted, so uh, had a lot of of big wig people in our shop uh, a lot. Just you know, what's the status of this? What's you know, why can't we get this turned around? So, uh, but I love that you know it was like really fast pace, and again with with what we were doing out there. 
it, it meant something. You Did know you feel I mean? that connection? I've, I've heard and read about a lot of times where air crews would, and maybe it's more of an Air Force thing, bring back tapes and specifically show it to the guys in, in the maintenance troops. So, hey, here's here's what you're, you got this jet up and this is the mission we did with it. It wouldn't sure. happen literally without you. Is that now, a, when that I experience? did that, when I was uh, O-level in the squadron, that would happen. When you're I-level, I mean, and, and that's where a lot of people, you know, that I-level, you, you just don't have that connection to the, the, the exact mission because – you know, you're just you're sitting in a shop that's got no windows. You're not outside. You're running up a piece of gear. You're 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 filling out a tag that says it's ready for issue, and then you're you're pumping it out the door, and you you never see the final product of it going into the airplane and and that airplane taking off and you know especially taking off with a bunch of bombs and then coming back and and being completely empty. You know, so um, you, you there's there's a lot of um, people that don't really get the job satisfaction that work in AIMD because they just don't. They don't see that piece of it, and no one, no one does because we're not really attached to the squadron. No one's coming down and saying, "Hey, Chris, check this out." So, you don't really get to see that. I, I will, I will, I will never forget the um, when everything was said and done, and we were we were out shopping and heading home. We had an old big awards quarters, and the maintenance officer for AMD had, had mentioned that we had, we had dropped a quarter of a million pounds of ordnance uh, throughout the uh, the support of Op- Operation uh, Enduring Freedom in Anaconda. And uh, he made the comment, and it, I just thought it was pretty funny. He's like, quarter million pounds of ordnance. You could drop a quarter million pounds of peanut butter on somebody and, and probably wreck their day. But, we're, you know, we're dropping ordnance on them. So, I mean, that kind of made you feel, you know, uh, good about what we were doing. But I, I think just in, in just the dynamic of it, I, I will say that when I was eye level at NAIMD versus when I was O level, there's a huge difference in how people kind of act and how they feel about their job. You know, the O level, I, I think you just have more camaraderie. You have more appreciation for what you're doing because you see it you know like uh you know if you're if you're sitting there trying to troubleshoot an airplane and you know they're they're calling hey we're going to close the cats on you you know we're closing the catapults are you going to get it up like yeah just give me like two more minutes two more minutes we'll get this thing going and you know you're able to fix the airplane and you know get it taxied over and and launched off the pointy end i mean it's just like you you can high five everybody and your your blood's pumping and your adrenaline's up. It's just, it's just a much better feeling than, you know, Hey, we got to get this card in this, in this box, you know, and get get it buttoned up and you know, get it it bubble wrapped. (laughs) (laughs) You know, when it matters and you get that feeling and probably that satisfaction too. Awesome. Okay. So first deployment back, where'd you go back home to? Um, or was home when the carrier pulled back in? San Diego. Okay. So San Diego, and I was a uh, ship's company, and I, I did not I, – I was a third class, so technically I was not eligible for BAH. So my home was the ship, which was uh, – Oh, my. I, I didn't think it was going to be that big a deal, but, uh, you know, when, when you're done – you know, because you work Monday through Friday when the ship's in port, you're working – in, in, in your shop that you would normally be at when you're underway. And then, uh, you know, when it's quitting time, it was like, oh, we'll see you tomorrow. And you're just sitting there like, well, I'm just going to sit here and watch TV in my shop. And, you know, it's uh, – um, it, it was a little different. You know, it's uh, – so luckily I made second class, which made me eligible for BAH. Um, and so I immediately put in my chick because I needed to get off the uh, off the ship and live out on my own. So uh, – but I did um, I did three years in San Diego, and then I was uh, there for the home port change of the Stennis. The Stennis went up to Bremerton. Okay. And my last year on board uh, the Stennis there, we were in a dry dock, which is really cool to see an oh, aircraft wow. carrier yeah. in a in a dry dock. Um, so I got to go underneath the ship and actually touch the bottom of the Stennis. That's you know, incredible. Yeah. Thinking about every bug I ever stepped on with my foot, you know, like they could have their sweet revenge. But just seeing <laughs> the, the the size of the props and the rudders on that on the, yeah. it's just am, uh, amazing how much of the ship you, you, is underwater that you don't see. That, um, and so it was it was good. I was uh, at at the time I had just made first class too. I, so the Stennis was uh, awesome. I showed up there uh, as a brand new third, and I left in four years. Uh, chief eligible. I had taken the chief uh, exam uh, in the in the Stennis's mess decks uh, and then made it. Uh, Chris, off that's that incredible. Exam. Truly, I mean, yeah. I'm trying to do the math in my head here, but I'm I'm a little slow. That's really fast. So it was a it was a seven year chief, and everybody uh, knew it when I made chief. <laughs> Every chief knew it. I was a yes, marked they, they I do, was a marked man. You, so. you were. <laughs> wow. Okay. So uh, it was a good and bad thing, you know. Uh, a lot I, of pride, though. I mean. It, yeah, it's got to be a very small club of folks that make it that far that fast. Yeah, it was. Um, you know, was I ready for it? I, I don't know. It was. Yeah, you had to be right because uh, you know when you when you put it on, nobody knows that you're a seven year chief or a, a fifteen year chief. You know, you're just the chief. So absolutely. Um, you know, it, it was definitely uh, something that uh, there was a sharp learning curve, and 
you know, it, uh, there was some mistakes, a lot of mistakes made along the way, you know, a lot of leadership uh, journeys that I had to go through and, and, and learned a lot. But, uh, you know, I think in, in the long run, uh, towards the end of my career, you know, when, when I think that, man, more than 70% of my career was as a chief, I was, uh, you know, I had a lot of experience to offer the, the chief's mess and some of the incoming chiefs. So, I, you know, I was definitely able to, to learn and grow with that, that experience and then able to pass it on into, into the mess. You know, I'd, I'd always wanted to be a maintenance mass chief, and uh, that, that was something that I, I just really, uh, looking back on from my junior airman days, I wanted to be an AVCM, which, you know, AT, uh, when, they, when they make mass chief, it combines with AE. Did so, not know that. Yep, okay. so avionics and electricians, they combined to AVCM. So, I mean, I, I really wanted to be an AVCM and, you know, run a maintenance de- uh, department. So, well, probably one of my only regrets of my career was just that I didn't hit that milestone. And, you know, it wasn't uh, that it wasn't available. I, I, if I'd stayed in, it probably would have happened eventually just by sheer numbers because I was at, for as young as I was. But, sure. um, you know, hey, I, I'm definitely not a... Uh, like I said, that's, if that's your only one regret, then yes. that's pretty good. You did but, pretty darn well if that's the only regret. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So when I left the Stennis, uh, I went to CNAT U Jacksonville, and I was uh, an instructor. And um, was only there for like six months, and then the results came out where I made chief. And uh, so did the chief's initiation process. At the time, it was called induction. I know it's, it's changed throughout the years. It used to be uh, initiation, induction. There's There's been... All these different terms for it because it, you know everybody's got to make their mark on it and say we're changing it and reshaping it and so I think it's actually come back full cir- circle to where you can call it initiation again. But anyway, uh, I was inducted uh, in 2006 as a as a chief petty officer. Um, where I made it at CNAT U Jacksonville, uh, we made 18 chiefs uh, at CNAT U. And I think that the chief's mess at the time had 18, so we pretty much like doubled the chief's mess overnight. Um, so they, they basically said, uh, we love you, but you gotta go. Like you are no, you cannot stay here. Can't stay so here. Yeah. My, my wife at the time, we, so my wife, I met her on the Stennis, uh, through a friend of a friend and, um, <clears throat> she was in Pensacola as a, uh, she was an air traffic controller and she was stationed here as an instructor and I was in Jacksonville as an instructor and if you've ever driven from Pensacola to Jacksonville, you want to shoot yourself in the face. It's a long drive. And to do that, like almost weekly, one of us was doing that drive. I mean, it was it was uh, tough on a relationship, of course, you know, because you're, you're getting into like, well, I've done it two times this month. You know, it's your turn. So it, it becomes a chore almost, you know, because it is just there's nothing to look at. So, um, so they I actually had a. Uh, spouse colo in and they said since you know we, we got to move all these chiefs out we'll uh move you to pensacola so they couldn't uh put me at uh nat center because she was a uh, second class and i was a chief so obviously conflict of interest there so they put me in a quad zero billet um it was actually an abec uh billeted job and i was the crash and salvage and arresting gear chief here at nas pensacola so the e28 arresting gear of course uh, yeah i i was the <clears throat> chief that was in charge of all the maintenance and upkeep and then also the uh you know crash and salvage if, if whenever necessary so uh, a lot of training that had to go in with that but i had a, a shop of probably about 30 uh they were abes abs and abhs on their shore tour um over there at the uh at air ops and so i did that for uh two years and that was a interesting experience well, and i was gonna say i imagine it is I, I know literally nothing about arresting gear i'm trying to think of what platforms so obviously hornets here in the day t2s t2s at the time yep um, t39s but no hook for them right probably t34s here at vt10 i don't remember if they had them I, okay so i was here when the t45 was uh just net coming online to okay. be here and um, they were talking about how they were going to be probably the biggest customer of uh, the arresting gear. But honestly, the, the biggest at the time was the Blues. Okay. The Blues used uh, the arresting gear quite quite frequently. Um, and it's just by virtue of, of how the uh, hide system is and a lot of, you know, just a lot of your emergencies, how, okay. the, how they pan out. It's, it's, it know, drives you into dropping it drives, a hook and exactly. taking, a, taking yep. a trap. Okay. Uh, I, I thought it interesting uh, that the T-45, if you get a low fuel light, I, and I don't know if this is true s- still, but they were talking if you get a low fuel light, it, it requires a trap. 
And I guess because your uh, single engine hide system probably runs an off the engine. So if you run out of fuel, then you would, you know, lose braking. Yeah, I, I, that makes perfect sense. So, okay. um, but th- uh, there's a lot of maintenance that comes with the E28. We had daily, so we had to go out and make sure that all the engines could fire up because um, here, um, well, shoot, just uh, not so long ago, it was like single runway wops out here. I was there doing the resurfacing. So the fact that we have the dual runways back is, uh, and and the par- uh, the intersecting runway there that was uh, turned off for quite some time. I know when I was when I was over at the Blues, we were single runway ops for about two years, really, uh, because they they were resurfacing all the other runways, okay. and then there was a lot of um, there was a lot of sinkholes and there was taxiways that were sinking and whatnot. So they were trying to do all the the repairs to that. So. Uh, but, you know, if you're single runway ops and you have an aircraft that traps and you've got people that are airborne that are close to bingo and whatnot, luckily we have a lot of uh, diversion fields around here. But, you know, depending on uh, the situation, you know, uh, you don't want to tie up a, a runway. So we had a lot of uh, drills that we would run. We'd have the dailies to make sure all the engines could fire up and bring the tapes in because there's these big tapes on reels and then there's the cross deck pennant. And so when the reel goes out then you fire up this like four cylinder gas engine and it, and it basically, you know, brings the tapes in and, and resets the cross deck pennant across. So, um, you know, you're getting screamed at by the tower, like, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, you know, and it's, it's always like, you'll do the daily on it. It fires up just fine. But then when the, when there's an aircraft sitting there, uh, you know, uh, the, the engine won't start and you're, you know, so there's been a lot of times where we'd have to strip the cross deck pennant and just get it out of the way, get everything moved out and, you know, kind of, uh, work on, um, uh, getting the engine to fire up so we could get everything retracted. And so just an interesting, uh, uh tour, you know, got to see, yeah. um, you said two what, years, two years, okay. um, because I, I'd, I'd been on my shore tour for about 18 months when I left seen at you. So they put me for, uh, two years here. So like it overshored me by six months, which everybody told me was going to be a career killer. And, you know, what are you thinking? You know, you don't ever want to extend your shore tour and, you know, but I'm like, Hey, I'm seven year chief. I got time to recover, you know? So funny how that stuff works out. Isn't so, it? Right. So well, you know, any, any memorable stories, uh, running the, I'm, I'm sure there's a couple, any, any that you can tell running the um, arresting There was here? a lot of, I mean, memorable, it, they're probably not appropriate for this venue. I mean, there's, <laughs> I, there was a lot of sailor stuff, you know, that oh, the, okay. the, the ABs are, I, they're, they're a great bunch. You know, the, if you tell yes. them to break down a brick wall, their bare hands, they're going to do it they for will. you. But yeah. uh, by virtue of just their, their seagullingness, they stuff a lot of their problems on, you know, into their sea bag and they go underway. And then when you're on shore duty, there's no place to stuff those problems anymore. So, so what a way to learn as a seven-year chief with right. that, with that oh, crew. Yes. Luckily, I had a great, um, great divo. Um, Lamar Bradley's actually still on base here. He's, he works over at CNAT uh, headquarters, and uh, but one of the best devos I've ever worked for. So, um, w- was able to uh, kind of help guide me, but you know did a lot of uh, just he was a, a chief and then made LDO, and um, he just never forgot where he came from. Like you know, just always had the sailors in mind, and you know was uh, willing to listen to any ideas I had, and, and you know let me run things uh, while still giving me the stick and rudder to, to ensure. Uh, everything was was happening the way he he wanted it to happen. So, uh, I had an os- awesome opportunity um, and some awesome guidance and, and mentorship from him. So I will say this: uh, if it makes you feel any better, when uh, at OCS, one of the things they beat into us for you know the DI RDC, they beat into us pretty early is you don't know anything. You are a, especially as an ensign, you literally don't know anything. Trust your chief. Right. You have to because you're not going to be able to manage any of this stuff yourself to start off with. No one. No one can. You right. have to get that experience, and you bring that that we don't have. Right. So that's that's awesome. You guys have that relationship. Right. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a little nerve wracking because <laughs> I you're, can imagine when you don't feel like you have all that experience, but you're expected to have it. So, but like you said, no, when they see the anchors, no one knows. Right. I don't know exactly. Yeah. They, and that, that was beat into my head. Like, hey, when you're you're when you're at the exchange and Airman Timmy comes up to you and asks you a question, they're expecting you to know. You yeah. know, when you know, just think about when you were in boot camp and Chief was God, and now you are that you are they you are you are that person. So. Uh, thinking about it, though, I, I, uh, an interesting story, uh, the Blue Angel Homecoming Air Show, obviously a big, big deal here. Um, it was the practice show 2008 for the practice show. And uh, on a Friday, there was a FJU-8. Was that the Fury? Is that the— uh... Yes, yes, yes. One of the few still around. I think the only one still around. Well, it's like a saber, right? It it, like it looks like it looks like an F-86, yes. correct. But the naval version, and I'm, I'm butchering that entirely. correct. Um, so, uh, 
I was on the phone with someone in the tower. Uh, it was one of the AC1s who was kind of like overseeing the tower operations. And we were talking about the Christmas party because it's, you know, uh, November time frame. The, the Christmas party's coming up. I was the MWR chief. He was my MWR first class. And okay. We're just, you know, kind of, you know, squabbling about, you know, what, what kind of prizes are we going to have, this, that, the other. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm sitting, you know, where the resting gear barn I is? Do. It's, Absolutely. It's basically kind of right across from the tower, uh, you know, airfield, you know, couldn't throw a stone at it, but you can definitely see. This is the old, like the tower on this side of the base or no, on no, the far no. side? Well, so Air Ops, where I worked, was at the old tower. Correct. Yeah. So, so the arresting gear is right next to Air Ops. Exactly. Currently. So now, now the tower is on the far side of the airfield. I know the they were side. redoing that fire station. Yep. Yeah, it's totally done. It looks beautiful. Is it done? Now. Okay. Yeah. So uh, right next to door. Right next to that, there's like a barn. There's like a big brown yes, barn looking absolutely. building. That was where I worked out of. That's where okay. my office was. And then I think that's still where those guys work. I'm pretty sure it is. Yeah. Um, Sorry. I just want to kind of paint the yep, picture. Absolutely. Because. I don't know when the tower changed over before my time here. Certainly, it was definitely before because that tower was there when I was here in two thousand seven, two thousand eight timeframe. Okay. So okay. I, I'm sure it was probably even prior to that because that tower would, had been there I think uh, quite a few years even before then. So okay, so we're just having a conversation talking about uh, you know what we're going to do for the Christmas party, and he's just all of a sudden, Chief, I gotta go, I gotta go, and he and just hangs up abruptly. And I, I was outside just because I, I didn't get very good reception inside the barn there. So I'm outside and, and I'm kind of watching some of the air show stuff. And it was during the uh, the Super Hornet demo. Uh, so I think like 106 had an airplane over there and, and, and the Super Hornet flies by. And as I'm, I'm catching it going f- uh, from left to right, I, I look down and there's that FJU-8 Fury on its belly skidding across the runway. And so... Um, luckily was able to kind of ride itself on the uh the runway and then just barely kind of get over onto the the side there and its wing kind of hit the dirt and it it did like a 360 and uh no fire or no nothing anything like that but uh so i immediately run in the shop like get the crash and salvage trailer going because we had a a trailer with all the stuff inside of there that we'd hook up the truck to and, and get out there and um you know, luckily nobody was hurt. You know, everything, uh, you know, immediately got out of the, the airplane. And, um, you know, I, ne- I never really got the uh, the down and dirty of exactly what happened. Obviously, I heard from the tower folks of what they said happened. And then I, I heard he had his own version of it. And um, uh, the, the version that I heard was that the, the, the controller never said check wheels down, oh which is it's just like, I guess, something in the 7110 that you're, yep. that is like, it you is. know, but there's like a, a blurb that says, although this is standard phraseology for, you know, uh, ultimate responsibility falls on the pilot. So there was a lot of just back and forth as to, you know, you didn't say check wheels down. And, you know, and at the time, uh, you know, uh, now that I've, I've, I've dabbled with aviation a little bit, flying on my own, I, I can see how you can get task saturated and, and something where you're used to a check wheels down. That's my indicator of, of making sure. You know, if you if you're in the moment and that doesn't happen, and you don't have that reminder, how quickly it can it can happen. So, um, regardless, it happened. Um, we we ended up having to because uh, you know Friday practice air show. They wanted that airplane off the runway for for Saturday's air show because you know it's closing a runway. It's it's just an eyesore. It's just sitting out there. Um, and so we, we ended up having to call the, the crane company out and use these belly bands to get it around and up onto a, 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 a plane. And the pilot was kind of over my shoulder the entire time because, you know, this is a, I think it was the last flying one uh, of its uh, kind. So obviously we needed to take great care. And he wanted us to wait because he had a special sling that he could have FedEx. But, you know, again, the, the air show committee and the, the base, everybody was like, yep, get it out of here. So I'm trying to you know, uh, dance this dance with this guy, you know, and let my guys do what they need to do while, you know, making sure he's, he's happy. Yeah. At the end of the day, it, we got it off the runway and, uh, you know, everybody was happy. And, and the jet flew again. I know. I'm pretty sure yeah. it did. Yeah. And the video does exist on YouTube. I oh, have wow. found okay. it. So I'll have to, I'll have to pull it up one day and, and find, I know it's, it's yeah, I know I it's on it. there, but, uh, um, I've come across it, but it, yeah, it was just one of those things where just, how quickly something could happen, you know, Absolutely. there yeah. I am talking about, you know, door prizes for a party. Next thing you know, we're going into, you know, rescue mode. So absolutely. That's really cool. Yep. So from Pensacola, uh, my wife decided to get out of the Navy because we just thought it would be best to focus on one career, uh, which I think was a smart, smart move because doing dual military is, is, is rough and it's, it's hard enough, uh, especially knowing one of us would have to go to, to sea duty. So, um, I, I asked her, uh, 
here? Are you opposed to going to Lemoore, California? <laughs> And and luckily oh, she to be a fly on that wall. Oh, luckily she had no idea anything <laughs> oh, of Lemoore, gosh, California. Chris. Oh man! And uh, I, my dad was stationed in, in Lemoore, so I'd, I'd grown up there. I'd, I'd uh, remember it uh, quite well. And I was a young kid, and I used to ride my bike all over the town. And I just thought it was a you know a cool little spot. And you know I I, I really wanted to go to uh, Hornets. I, I wanted to go. I wanted the fast pace. I wanted the you know, and I wanted to, to get my safer flight and, and be a part of, of just all the maintenance stuff. Because as an eye level guy, you know, you, I, I just, when I was done at, at my job at AIMD, I would always go to Vulture's Row and just watch the magic happen on the flight deck. You know, it was like one of the things I look forward to doing. And I just wanted to be a part of that in some way, shape, or form. So having no O level experience whatsoever and still being a very young chief, I got orders to VFA 154 in Lemoore, California, and uh, showed up and just as green as could be, you know, just, uh, never been O level and, and kind of opened myself up to the, you know, airmen in the line shack and just teach me, you know, show me, like, I, I just want to learn. I want to know what you know. And I, you know, I want to know what I can do to make your life easier and better. And just, um, just learn all I can about the O level side of maintenance. So, uh, once again, made a lot of mistakes I mean, I have quite a few regrets of, of things and how things were handled and what I could have done differently. But, you know, if you don't just jump out there and do it, you're never going to, you know, it'll never happen unless you're you're just pushing forward and doing stuff like that. So I was there for a year. I was the AVARM uh, division chief and uh, learned a lot through, like, I don't know, do this, uh, 53 have, like, CWTPIs? Do you have any kind of weapons uh, kind Fif- of stuff? 50 is for defense uh, defense only, and then we have chaff and flares, so daily air 47. So, I mean, they do have, like, release and control checks, I would imagine, then, yes, for the chaff absolutely. and flare? Yep. Okay. So is there any, uh, like, annual or pre-deployment inspection to do a, uh, like, a weapons proficiency? There's the got to be. I'll be honest. Uh, we <clears throat> never carry I, I personally never carry chaff or flares. I, gotcha. I can think on one hand a handful of JOs that got to fire them in Bahrain, and that was it. Gotcha. Unfortunately. Now, I've shot the gun. Obviously, the guys in the back did. So, But that's a crew serve weapon, so it's pretty, hey, guys, you do your checks ahead of time. When we're on the range, they'll do their checks. You know, we clear them to open fire, clear safe, and then we're off. But it's a gotcha. little, little bit different. It's not a tactical platform at all. Well, obviously, with the Hornet and its its wide range of weaponry, yes. um, they, they do a, the release and control checks, or what they're called, RNCs is the, okay. the acronym. And uh, when I when I had gotten in the squadron, they were done every seven days. So you have 12 aircraft in a, in a typical squadron, and every seven days you have to run the whole gamut of release and control checks. So, And then um, uh, one of the pre-deployment checkoffs that you have to do is you have to pass a CWTPI, which is like conventional weapons, test proficiency inspection, I believe, uh, from... Uh, but it's a, you, you go and uh, there has to be you have to sit through a, a school where they basically teach you about the LWS your uh, loading weapons manual uh, you have to um, and then perform a release and control check and it's a whole series of things so your, your gunner of the squadron he gets a loadout saying okay you're gonna have two aircraft with this loadout and so he has to basically configure the aircraft which pylons where is he gonna hang them it all has to be a legal load uh, because um, even though that it might fit or it might, it may not be something that's been tested. And so that there's, um, you know, uh, a, a manual that basically states what you can put next to what, what can be where, what stations you're allowed to use. So that's a graded evolution. And then when, uh, when that's done, then the, the AOs, uh, the ordnance men, they'll have to do all the arming checks of the, of the, uh, weapons, you know, they'll have to basically like if they were getting them, uh, not, they're not inert, but they're, uh, you know, out of the, the holds. They'll basically have to get them to a ready for installation uh, status, you know, making sure all the checks and everything are done. And then the AT side of it, the avionics guys, they'll have to run all the, the release and control checks for that uh, that loadout. And then that's all graded. And so it's a, it's a huge deal, you know, if you pass your CWTPI. So within, you know, three, four months of me checking into the squadron, we, we had to be ready for a CWTPI. So once again, I had to be, you know, kind of up to speed with everything. You know, I basically read the LWS uh, from cover to cover, uh, had to learn how, uh, pow- you know, all the different power buses within the F-18, you know, uh, configurations, uh, how, how those all worked with, with, with everything, how the release and control, uh, they call it watt gear, uh, wraparound test gear, how that, uh, integrated into the, into the stations and how it talked to the airplane and 
just a lot of stuff to, to learn. And then on top of just running a division, doing my collateral duties, all that kind of stuff. And, and then trying to work my safer flight on top of that. So crammed a lot into that year, but it, it paid off because I ended up getting my safer flight towards the end of that first year I was on board. And uh, we went on deployment uh, about a year after I checked in and my ma- maintenance master chief made me the FDC, the flight deck uh, coordinator. So it's a pretty big deal. I can remember it very vividly. Um, anybody that's been on the ship back aft uh, around Ready 8, Ready 9, depending on what kind of carrier you're on, uh, right where the LSO platform is, there's a big hatch. And I was the night FDC. And so I open the hatch and, and shut it and it just goes completely black. I mean, it's just pitch black. You can't even see your hand in front of your face. And I probably had as much flight deck time as a, a tiger on a tiger cruise. You know, I'd, I'd gotten my safety observer signed off, but I, I mean, the, I, had, I had not had the operational flight deck experience that I probably should have had, you know, but I can remember just taking a deep breath and said, well, it's time, time to rock it, I guess, you yes. know, sink it's or swim. Very, very dangerous place, very dynamic place. Oh, absolutely. As we just learned I, yes. uh, yesterday, know, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, unfortunately. I'm praying for those uh, individuals involved. And, absolutely. Uh, you know, absolutely. That's, that's something that I was I was meaning to talk about because, you know, I, I, so I walked up by the LSO platform and where you're at on the LSO platform, if I had been smart, I would have gone on the other side because you're kind of like, you're stuck in that little place between the landing area and where you actually need to be. And so you have to signal to the, the uh, guy that lets you cross the uh, LA, you know, so you have to shine your light and then get a, get a signal back. And then you're allowed to, to go once you get the signal and then you've got to run across the LA as, as fast as can be. And then, you know, make sure you're, uh, you know, staying outside the, uh, the uh, landing area there. So I was like, well, that was dumb. I shouldn't have come up on this side. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> um, Cause you get stuck back there. But anyway, it's, it's just one of those things where, well, okay, I'm doing it all, I guess, tonight. And then, you know, running underneath uh, the EA-6Bs are like the worst. You got to kind of, you know, uh, snake through them the way that the engine cans are pointed down. So, you know, you, you just, you, I, I just trying to do all that at night and, and run the roof and, and, and coordinate down to maintenance control and through flight deck control. I mean, I was probably in way over my head at times, but uh, it was, it was a rush. Oh man, it was a rush. Um, so I really relied on the shooters that I had. You know, they were uh, basically dragging me along. Uh, had a couple, uh, they had a couple choice words at times for me, and it was probably all well-deserved. And, uh, you know, there's a couple times where, you know, I'm just was petrified, just standing there petrified as to what, what do I do? And, the, you know, what is the call for this? You know, like, is this up or down? They're, they're telling me this aircraft's down, pilot's saying it's up, flight deck control's yelling at you. You know, it's just you're, you're trying to get a word in edgewise because everybody's – there's there's typically two channels on the on the flight deck uh, radio channel. There's the main channel, and then you you know you switch down or switch up depending, and and that's where you can talk to your your maintenance control, so you're not clogging up the uh, the airways on the main channel where where dog and everybody else is listening. Um, so, but then if everybody switched up and and talking their their base, you know, talking to maintenance, you know, it, it's it's tough to get a a word in edgewise. So. Uh, but man, you know, after a while you, you get used to the, there is a rhythm to the flight deck. Um, you know, there's, they, they get everything up and ready. They call starts, everything comes up and ready. And then they start breaking chains and getting everybody kind of taxied in position and, you know, everything you can, you can time a watch to it. You know, it's, it's, if starts are at this time, they're calling it right at this time. If the launch is at this time, it's, it, they're, they're launching, you know, everything kind of happens in a, a sequential rhythm so you, you get that complacency where everything's just kind of flowing and, and uh but at the same time you're always keeping your mind especially uh during uh recoveries when you know there's so many things that could happen with it with an aircraft uh coming in i don't know how fast they come in like 125 knots roughly you know just come screaming into uh you know to try to catch four wires that you know are bringing them to a screeching halt you know but you got to kind of think about it but compartmentalize it you know while still think you know you you compartmentalize it but it's still something that you're paying attention to every time I would always kind of pause look over my shoulder once once everything was settled and stopped I would I would continue on what I was doing you know for every recovery just because I mean at a moment's notice it it could happen something could happen Um, so yeah definitely praying for all those out there on the Vincent and we hope they're they get a safe return uh Luckily, I've, I've made contact with people I know out there, and it th- sounds like everybody's stable and things are, are kind of settling out. So I just hope that uh, – because um, 
yeah, it just it's a very small I, world. It is a very small world, and I, you know I'm just so thankful that um, you know for all the deployments I went, uh, especially in, on, on the low level, I was able to uh, bring all 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 sailors, all aircraft, everybody uh, came home, and that's a when you think about what we do out there. And you think about just the the coordinated uh, chaos that is that goes on. It's really a, an amazing feat to have a, a carrier go through a, a deployment and not lose hundred you know hundred people. You know, it's just it's 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 crazy how uh, dangerous it is out there, and it just becomes routine, which it, it shouldn't, but it, it it does. It's just human nature. There's that that only happens really with good training and folks that you know you can trust, and it's a right. team that you build. I don't know a lot of these words sound trite and probably overused in in society, but. No, trust is key. You know, I, I learned that. That was a, a big thing I learned in it, 154 is, is you know, you're talking with, uh, you know, an 05, you're, you're, you're a skipper. And, you know, if there if there is any doubt in that trust, I mean, it's just, you, you just be, be gone with you. You know, you, you, you offer nothing. You know, it, the trust is like one of the biggest saying because, you know, if you say something's going to happen or if you're, if you're given the thumbs up, they have to know that, you know, it is good. You know, your word is, is gold, you know, so it's just it's a it's a really big deal. So I think that's something really special about naval aviation. And a lot of people will talk about you know, Air Force versus Navy comparison. You know, Air Force is a very big book of you can only do this. And if it's not in that book, you can't do it. Right. The, the way that everyone says it, naval aviation is the other way around. There's a list of things you can't do and everything else is kind of open to interpretation. Sure. But we shoot people in the face, I would argue, pardon the expression, probably a little more frequently than the other services because we give you that trust, but you better earn it. Right. And like you said, if not, you're gone. And right. I don't know. I, uh, and what little understanding I have of those services, but the difference being I think we cultivate a different, different level of a leader at all levels, not just officer, enlisted, senior enlisted, everywhere sure. with that added. And I don't know. At least that's been my there's, I think there's a little bit experience. of flaw in, in the enlisted side of just how we, how we promote, you know, um, our, our eval system is very cutthroat uh, and, yes. then, and then, yes. you know, so, so you're, you're always striving for that early promote eval and, you know, there's only a certain percentage that can be given out through every, uh, you know, uh, reporting cycle. So, you know, it, it gets a little cutthroaty, uh, amongst those rank, you know, as you're, as you're kind of, uh, jockeying up the positions there. And then when you make chief, we're told, everything that you've done up to this point means nothing, you know, like forget that whole way of life. It's, it's, it's not about this, you know, like everything that you've done to get here, forget about it. And then, you know, I, I wish we would teach a little bit more. Um, I, I, you know, what's, what's the perfect solution? You know, you hear all the time people talk about Marine pros and cons. That's a better solution or, you know, promotion this way, promotion that way, getting rid of tests. I mean, What's the best way to do it? You know, that's going to be the age old, uh, you know, debate dilemma. Yeah. Dilemma, you know, debate. Um, I, I honestly think though, just open and honest, you know, uh, one of the things that is always missing that I, I, I wish there was just more, uh, emphasis on is, you know, midterms, uh, counseling sessions, you know, you say the word counseling in the Navy and then people immediately cringe. They think they're in trouble, you know, and it's like, no counseling, uh, mentorship, you know, they've tried all these, these programs, you know, to try to, to put the emphasis on these things to happen throughout the year. So it's not a, a, a shock when, you know, this is put in front of you. If you're having open and, and honest dialogue with your sailors throughout their, their the entire reporting period, not just, you know, when it comes down to eval time and you're, you're getting their brag sheet together, I, I think it could be a little bit better. But, you know, um, did, did I always do that? No, you know, so um, that's that's just one of those things. Uh, it. It is what it is, and it's 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 worked so far, I guess. But uh, you know, I guess there's always places that they could improve. Could always be better. Yep, we and could I, always try for that. I hear there's uh, sailor sailor 360 now or something. They're 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 and they're trying to do that sailor 2025 initiative and change some of the eval stuff. I mean. I, I apologize if this is all incorrect information. You know, <laughs> once I made the uh, d- determination I was retiring, I kind of unplugged from all the nav admins and and whatnot. So you know, the, the Navy's going to keep on and and do its thing. But I just I haven't stayed up to speed with all that stuff. So totally fair. It yep. will it will survive without us. Yep. Uh, that's one thing that I was taught very early was absolutely you can be here for an eight hour day or a twelve hour day. Yeah. You know, your family remembers if you were there for an eight hour day or a twelve hour day. The organization does not, and that's not a that's not an excuse or a reason to not do your job well. Just you sure. have to throttle that. You know, when sure. there's what is that shore duty, sea duty. When there's time, take it. And when right. there's not, there's the mission and go get that mission done. Yep. So that was VFA one fifty four I talked about. Um I did the flight deck uh control flight deck coordinator uh job and then went to maintenance control and I did maintenance control the rest of my time there. So 
uh, learned a lot. It was just really fun. Um, again, uh, talking about AIMD and then and then a squadron. I mean, there's just no comparison. Uh, you know, going to going to Fallon and and loading loading ordnance and and having them drop bombs and and just you know being able to hang out with the the squadron personnel afterwards and you know just making making mission and you know you're always uh, trying to one up your your sister squadron and be the best in the CAG and you know it's just it's just I I, I kind of really 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 enjoyed that that aspect of it so um, but when it came time to uh, pick new orders. Uh, the wife said anywhere but Lamore. She had had enough. So um, fair, yeah, fair. And you know, she she would complain about the heat. She would complain about you know a lot of things. And I'm like, well, you know, it's not so bad. You know, the summers aren't as bad as as you're making them out to be. And and she looked right at me and said, "You've been gone every summer." And I thought about it, and she was correct. I was deployed the first and the second or the third summer we were there. And then the the second and fourth summer we were there, I was on Rimpack and then Fallon. So I hadn't really actually uh, spent a full summer in Lemoore. So I was like, okay, fair enough. So um, looking at the the uh, very wide range of orders, which was like uh, two sets, um, there was an opportunity to go to Whidbey Island. Um, and at the time, this was right when the Growler was coming online. Um, so anybody that had super background, they were really trying to pluck up to to Whidbey uh, because they needed that that Super Hornet experience. Because you know the the Growler is is ninety seven percent a Super Hornet. I mean, it, the only thing that's different is the AEA palette, which replaces the gun. It's it's a big uh, um, electronics palette that's that's put up in the in the nose, and then the the wingtip pods. You know, there's and there's a few varying uh, differences, but. For the most part, everything else is the same. Engines, uh, generators, all the all, you know, the overall airframe is is the same. So, <clears throat> I, I took orders to VAQ-137, and it just happened to work out to where, since it was considered uh, back-to-back sea duty, that I was able to get a back-to-back sea duty bonus, which was which was nice, and uh, made the wife happy because we're getting you know she didn't like the fact that I was going back-to-back sea duty, but we're getting a little chunk of change, and it gets her out of Lemoore. And um, luck ha- be what it is, I, I was supposed to go to VAQ-137, which was like the worst of the worst in the Growler community. So since all the Growlers are in Whidbey Island, there's kind of a hierarchy. So it's like the worst is a Growler squadron on the East Coast because when you deploy, you've got to get all your tools, parts, and materials across the United States over to Norfolk, load it onto the boat. You know, you hope that all the planes make it across without any issues. And, you know, if they do, now you got to send a maintenance crew or, you know, figure out if the wing's going to send a, a, another squadron out there. It's just, so that's the worst, you know. And then the, the second worst is, uh, you know, uh, a West Coast squadron, you know, that's deploying on the ship, so a shipboard. And then the cream of the crop is the expeditionary squadron. So, um the story that I've been told was the Air Force after the EF-111, after they kind of discontinued the EF-111, did not pick up in the uh, electronic attack uh, kind of spectrum. They put a lot more emphasis on, like, stealth technology and that kind of thing. So in doing so, uh, with the with the E-18G, I guess one of the, the deals that was made was the Navy will augment the uh, the Air Force in that regard. So they have, I think it's now up to five or six squadrons that are expeditionary um, that kind of are also, uh, the Marines had EA-6Bs up until just recently, so they're they're going to uh, offset the Marines because they did not go to the, the Growler at all. Uh, they put all their money in the F-35. And um, uh, so the Navy is kind of carrying that uh, electronic attack load right now. So... The expeditionary squadrons, uh, we did a lot of joint tasks with the uh, Air Force, went to a lot like Mountain Home and Nellis. We were uh, involved in a lot of like red flags. And then when, when we deployed, I, I was supposed to go to 137, and, and for whatever reason, I just got redistributed to VAQ-132, and it, it ended up being uh, a expeditionary squadron. So I went to a East Coast uh, ship squadron to an expeditionary squadron, yeah, just jumped right up, right up the uh, the hierarchy there, yeah, and, sure. with, and without even knowing it, you know what I mean. I was just like, I, I just had orders to Whidbey. That's all I knew. And and you know, next thing I know, I'm like, oh, well, this sounds pretty. This sounds like a sweet deal. Which, 
you know, there's some there's definitely some pros and cons. Uh, the the turnaround cycle for an expedited squadron is only a year. So normally a, a ship going squadron is about 18 months. For an expeditionary squadron, you're you're once you come off deployment, you're pretty much uh, you, you go on your your stand down leave periods, and then when you get back, you're going right back into the workup cycle. So on a three year tour up in Whidbey, I, I deployed twice. But those deployments were to Misawa, Japan, where, I mean, it was pretty much, uh, we had the nicest hangar. It all had NMCI, the, the Navy uh, internet stuff, so it was like working at home. You had all the access to all the share drives and all, this, all the programs that you would need. Um, the Misawa is a beautiful base, beautiful area in, in Japan. Um, just had an awesome experience there was able to get some college done was able to to um you know still keep in touch with the family pretty regularly um and then what they would do in the expeditionary world was we were based out of misawa but we would do debts to osan korea or we'd go down to guam and we would participate with exercises and uh you know there's just a a bunch of different exercises that we would do uh throughout the region there just to kind of do a show of force and just uh you know maintain because um, we would work uh, with uh, the, the carrier wings and whatnot that was there, or whatever carrier was coming through in that in that area, we would kind of augment. Um, I think they're going to like a. Um, th- they've been talking about doing seven growlers in a in a carrier uh, air wing now, just because of how uh, formidable I guess the AEA is in the. Uh, so it's it's good to know that uh that that's it's you know a, a proven platform absolutely. And, um, you know, that I know there's probably so much more that they could do that we, we know, but, uh, even the stuff that I, that I was aware of, it's just like, it's mind boggling, you know, some of the, some of the things that they can do with the, the jamming and the, the signal intercepts and, you know, the, the different things that they can do. So, um, uh, pretty unique platform. What was it like working with the Air Force? Because that's probably, a, for, I would imagine probably the first time in your career where you had a very direct involvement with another service. It's interesting, you know, um. Uh, there, there was two two big things that stood out uh, that s- since you asked the first scenario I'll, I will never forget going to Osan Korea, and uh, we were I was one of the advanced debt chiefs. So um, you know we're going up there and we do, we do a site survey and we're 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 kind of getting the lay of the land. Here's where we're going to be staying. Here you know we're talking to the the uh, different coordinators, our liaisons and whatnot, and. Uh, we, we had a need for an extra uh, government vehicle arise. So we're like, hey, we need an extra uh, government vehicle because, and I, you know, some, some weird Air Force thing, you know, you're not allowed to do this. So in order to make this work, we're going to have to take a government vehicle over here and do it over here. You know, it's just one of those, you know, it's just the way we're going to have to operate while we're here. So we walk into whatever the, I think it's TLO, I think is what they call it. And it's whatever office, PLO, something like that. But walk into the office where you would request a government vehicle. And for sake of the, the conversation here was like, you know, you had Bob and Bill, you know, uh, those were the two desks. And so we go in and uh, we're like, hey, we need to check out a government vehicle. We need to put in a request for it. And so uh, Bob is over here and he goes, well, that's that's Bill's uh, expertise. Uh, he's the one who you get that form from. I'm like, okay, so where's, where's Bill? Well, he's at lunch. Well, can you give me the... Uh, the form like nope that's that's bill's department that's that's what he handles so it was like what time does he come back you know he comes back in about an hour so we come back in an hour and bill's there but bob's gone so we get the paperwork and we fill it all out and i'm like here you go bill here's the the paperwork and he goes nope you don't hand it to me that's bob's department you got to give it to bob he's the one who who processes the paperwork <laughs> you know so you're just like are you for real? Like, I'm like, are you messing with me? Like, is this how it works? But that's just how it works. You know, that's just the, the air force is very, they have uh, one specified thing they do and that's what they do. And they're very good at that one thing. But you know, if you try to mix and match or try to have them do, you know, they don't do the, the, you know, the Navy, it's like, Hey, if, if so-and-so has gone, you better know how to do their job you better know how to do this. So, you know, that's what we're kind of used to, but that's just kind of the experience the expected norm, you know, it's like, and, and, and you witnessed it because people would come in and be like, Hey, I need this paperwork. Oh, that's him. Okay. He's not here. Gone. You know, like they wouldn't even question it. Just, that's just the way it was. So, um, another thing too, like being in Osan, and this is more just, uh, by virtue of, of that region, it's a one year, uh, unaccompanied tour. So as soon as someone gets good at their job, they're gone. And then, so you're constantly dealing with people that just showed up. And so you're, you know, but I think that's more of a region thing, not an air force thing. 
so that was just in getting a, a government, uh, P, you know, POV that we had. Uh, we had another need for a Air Force piece of equipment. So on a on a on an Air Force base, they don't have the setup to do a high power like we would in the Navy. So since the Navy uh, takes off from aircraft carriers, the strongest point to hold the aircraft back is usually on the nose strut. So there's the hold back adapter that we can uh, basically put a big high power chain on. And uh, once you lock that into place and it goes into the ground receptacle, I mean, that thing's not going anywhere. You can take it to full uh, AB on both uh, both engines and, you know, it's not going to go anywhere, uh, rest assured. So, um, but that fitting doesn't exist anywhere on an Air Force base. They're not designed for that. So if we ever had to do a high power on an, on an Air Force base, uh, you have to get creative. So they, they do things where you get everything uh, <clears throat> together, and then the air crew will do a high power run down the runway or something. But <clears throat> it, that's is that the legal way to do it? It's about the only way you can do it sometimes, but there's times where you have to do leak checks at high power, you know? <clears throat> so when you're, when you're talking about certain, like a, a high pressure fuel pump or the, you know, these kinds of uh, uh, things, you need to have eyes on it while it's in a stationary position. So we had an issue with an aircraft in Guam. <clears throat> uh, the uh, afterburner on a, F-18 Super Hornet is all fuel actuated. <clears throat> so they, they basically circulate fuel into the actuators that open and close the cans of, of the engines. And what ends up happening is the, the bearings and the rollers that are inside of there, there has to be specific additives in the fuel in order for those to maintain, you know, like the lubrication and whatnot. So through the kind of few years of, of going to uh, different places and getting fuel from other uh, spots, th they, there was an issue that we came across where you would get what's called a hydromech fail, where the, um, so because they're fuel actuated, there's a FADEC, uh, full authority digital engine control, right? So the FADEC kind of senses fuel flow. And then if the fuel flow stops, it assumes a break in the line because, you know, if, if there's no fuel flow, it may be because a line is off, which means you're dumping fuel into the engine bay, which is a bad thing. So it immediately shuts the fuel off. So if there was ever a um, kind of bind in any of those actuators, the FADEX sensed a, a stoppage of the fuel flow and immediately shuts off fuel. So now what you have is you have a, a variable exhaust nozzle lockout, a VEN lockout. And that VEN lockout uh, is, it, you know, you, you lose performance in the engine. You know, the engine has to basically the open and close those uh, those exhaust nozzles in order to create thrust. And then once the engine can uh, spool up, you know, it opens back up. And so uh, it's, it can be a very scary thing if you have. And we, we had an aircraft in Guam that had a dual VEN uh, issue. So bas basically both the right and the left engine were basically just uh, the VENs were, were getting locked out. Well, we uh, had to do a high power, obviously, on, on that to do the op check. So there's no place in Guam to, to do a high power with the Navy setup. So if you get an F-15 holdback adapter, because the F-15 actually does have a hold, like a, a tail hook, um, and it's, I guess, very little known. I think the F-16 has one as well. Um, but they do have it for... Um, basically the each you know for the the shore based arresting gear for certain emergencies so there's a hold back adapter that would essentially wrap around the the super hornet tail hook and then they do have like a high power pad that you can uh hook that whole uh setup up to and do a high power on the uh on the growler or on any super hornet so i was tasked with talking to the uh you know, equipment manager for the, the base because they had one at Misawa. And so we, we had a jet that was stuck in Guam. We, uh, we left it behind and we were going to get all this equipment together and uh, uh, send a rescue debt down there and hopefully do a good op check and, and, and make sure we weren't going to have any VEN lockouts. And because having a VEN lockout going across the, the ocean there from, from Guam up to Misawa is probably not a, a good thing to have. So uh, we wanted to make sure that everything was 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 copacetic. So I talked to the Misawa uh, equipment manager, and he's kind of hemming and hawing about us, uh, you know, taking this piece of equipment. And uh, you know, I think it was like a, a E eighty nine in the in the in the Air Force. Can't make the decision. Says 
not, I can't do it. Can't do it. Can't let you take this, this piece of equipment. You got to talk to this guy. So I talked to the Navy, uh, it was the Air Force region. So it was basically like the Japan region uh, equipment manager. Had a lot of back and forth. You want to know, how are you going to inventory this thing? Well, you know, I, I, I showed him a, a copy of our tool checkout log and we'll do a daily procedure. And I had to send him copies of the, the NAMP that shows this is how our tool control program is run. And these are the kinds of things that we have. And, and it was like, it, for every answer I gave him, he saw our answer and would counter it with like, okay, so not only are you going to use your Navy form, but this is our Air Force form 2502. And, you know, this is how we do it. So I want you to do this as well. And, you know, I'm like, okay, well, fine. We'll do that form as well. We'll do it. Well, do you want us to fax you or, you know, scan a copy every day? And yes, absolutely. We want to make sure this thing is accounted for every day. So finally back and forth, back and forth. And he comes back. No, can't do it. Can't do it. Not going to, we're not going to allow this thing to go off station. Uh, you need to talk to the Pacific. So I talked to the Pacific, uh, air force, uh, equipment manager out of Hawaii, did the whole thing, pled my case. This is what we need. And same thing, after a ton of back and forth, they were like, no, we're not, we're not comfortable, confident that, you know, because they were having me uh, sign financial liability forms and, you know, wanted cost estimates if they had to replace this thing. And I mean, I'm just like, man, we're, what are we going to do in a time of war? You know, like, yeah. like we're on the same team here. You know what I mean? Like this is, uh, this is not a hard thing. You know, you, you do, a, we do this all the time in the Navy with uh, between sister squadrons or checking stuff out of AIMD. Like I, I could not believe how complicated they made the, uh, this whole process. And at the end of the day, they said, no, you know, like uh, and, and we had gone as far up as I think you could have gone, you know, gone to the Pacific uh, equipment uh, manager of this, of this. So as the Navy does, we figured it out. You know, we, we found another way. And I, I honestly, I, I can't even remember what we ended up doing. Uh, I was not on the rescue debt. We sent one of our really senior uh, power plants guys. He was a uh, kind of funny story, uh, really, really uh, unique individual. He always bragged that he made a second class twice and first class twice. And he was always proud of that. But he, he was uh, he was just a smart ass. You know, he was just, a, uh, just one of those guys that just, you know, he was uh, – he was very smart and he knew he was smart. And so if you were going to come at him with anything that was uh, uh, not fully correct or not, you know, uh, 100%, if you didn't know what you were talking about, he would uh, counter you and, and do it in a way that would let everybody know that, you know, you, you don't know what you're talking about. So uh, definitely had a, a very uh, interesting demeanor about him. But he ended up, when he made chief, he, he accelerated very quickly, kind of grew up a little bit. He still had that streak in him, so it made him it made it fun. But anyway, he was very smart, very smart uh, mech, and so he went down and made sure that the aircraft was good to go and, and ended <laughs> up making it back. But it's a it's a whole thing. The Blue Angels are actually dealing with that, with the uh, hydromech stuff. Really? Uh, because those are the older watt of jets, correct? No, well, it's, it's, a, it's a 414, so it's an okay. engine issue. Oh, so, okay. I mean, it's it's every Super Hornet. Um, hmm. and, it, and it all has to do with the, the fuel and the fuel additives that are in there to keep those bearings and those rollers and all the, the hydromech stuff, uh, like, properly lubricated so that they can that they don't bind up because – so that FADEC is very sensitive. If it senses any binding, even a momentary, it's going to assume a, a fuel leak, and it's going to sh- shut itself off. So wow. when th- with the Blues going to all these different air show sites and getting different kinds of fuels and not having the right specific F-coded, uh, you know, uh, uh, gas, you know, there's a, there's a ton that you're allowed to use per the, per the NATOPS, but, uh, you know, uh, using certain fuels uh, for prolonged time uh, can actually cause issues in that, in that whole system. So... They, they were kicking around. So this was one of the things that I was working on before I got out was um, they were going to make a device where you would basically hook up the – you would hook this thing up to the fuel port and then hook a fuel hose up to it and get cans of the additive and basically pump it through. You know, it, it would it would basically mix within the uh, the fuel system. So, so that, that was, actually sounds like Prist. So I'm sure you're familiar with that. Like when it comes out of a truck, it's not – well, you can have it pre-blended in the fuel, but mm-hmm. a lot of times there's just a can there – that as it comes out of the truck, the prist is added at a certain rate. Right. The only reason I remember that was being told if you got so much as a drop of that prist on your skin, you would die. And I don't know if that's <laughs> accurate or not. It's certainly probably a good story to keep sure. people you know, safe sure. from chemicals. Because I knew plenty of line guys when I was a line guy. No gloves, no nothing. And my mom, I'll never forget for Christmas, bought me a set of gloves and said, just wear these. She bought really, really nice work gloves. Right. So three months later, they're black. Oh, and it helped me realize all that you know, from jet fuel, from 100 low lead, right. just those hoses, that was going into my skin. Yep. Very humbling. So, yes. yeah, I would. I wonder if it's kind of a similar principle. Um, 
it is uh, to I, and I know of Prist because uh, when I was down in an uh, issue here, they would I, I would get random phone calls. Are we Prist or non Prist? What kind of fuel? You know, and okay, I, and answer was, that question for me because I probably should know. I always uh, say positive Prist. Positive Prist. Positive Prist. Is, is, okay, is the general consensus. So okay. um, it's on know, the record I, now. I, yep. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. This is so official here. So <laughs> exactly. So, um, what is Prist exactly? Because it's it's like an anti icing agent. Is Correct, it not? and it's also okay. anti fungal. So okay. there's fungus that will grow in, which kind of blows my mind, honestly, that a fungus right. can exist in jet fuel, but mm. it's both. So was well, this uh, as they're using more and more biofuels or anything like that? Which couldn't I, tell you. Yeah, it's I don't know. Above. Yeah, is it because they are they put? I don't. I don't know. I do. So this is kind of going back to uh, 154. Uh, we did the Great Green Fleet. I don't know if you heard of. I did hear that. I don't hear anything. <laughs> After that, but I remember that one. That so was a thing. imagine an, an entire aircraft f- carrier flight deck smelling like French fries. That's about the uh, extent of the Great Green Fleet. It was uh, interesting. So we used uh, biofuel. We did a whole large force exercise launch, which, you know, large force exercise, you're launching pretty much anything that's up on the roof off and then doing, you know, doing whatever ex- exercise and then recovering them all. And uh, so this was during uh, RIMPAC 2012, and um, which I don't know if you're familiar with RIMPAC. Uh, in name most of yeah. yeah so <laughs> what i've seen for, online so rim pack uh rim of the pacific exercise it's usually like you know there's probably 30 40 different nations that are they all come together it's a uh everybody kind of ships pull into hawaii there's all different flags flying there's all different countries a part of it and you you typically pull in and stay there for about four to five days and and there's a lot of uh meetings get togethers uh you know uh just a lot of social events and it's, you know, I'm sure a lot of planning, you know, just interacting kind of, and then you, uh, get underway for, for rim pack and usually do exercises for about three, three and a half weeks. And then, uh, come back into Hawaii and, and have a big debrief and a lot of, uh, outgoing parties and that and, and whatnot. And then, uh, there I've done a couple of rim packs and some have been like, while you're on deployment, you stop along the way and just do rim pack and then move on to, um, wherever you're going or there's times where you just do it as part of your workup exercises so you might leave two weeks early from RIMPAC, do your uh, uh jtfx or you know whatever kind of shipboard stuff that the ship might need to do as their pre-deployment checks and then move up to hawaii do the rim pack and then return home and then you know typically go from fallon but anyway it's a, it's a really big de- you know pretty big deal so during the 2012 rim pack there there was one of the last things that we were doing was uh, the great green fleet initiative which we were going to do this whole large force exercise with biofuels so uh they had um you know underway replenishment they had uh they had to clear out one of the the fuel tanks you know and fill it just with this uh bio grade uh, fuel we had to paint these green stripes on our airplanes so our corrosion was just freaking livid because you know they knew like we're painting this just for this dog and pony show and you you know it was like well how many jets do we need to do it on well you know at any one time uh, a super hornet squadron is probably going to have eight nine air- up aircraft at best you know well we're going to paint them on all of them because we don't know what aircraft are up and it's a large force exercise so all the aircraft are going to get flown off that if they're up they're flying so the day before we're supposed to do this large force exercise we have a full flight schedule, and, and it was like, hey, we're holding fuel on everything. They need to switch the tanks over. They need to get the fuel, you know, and then and then we'll fuel you, you know. So so flight deck control is telling you, like, don't don't be bugging us for fuel. We'll let you know when we're ready. Uh, but, you know, make sure, uh, you know, if, if there's an aircraft, we're, we're holding fuel because it's going to be chock full of this uh, biofuel stuff. Well, everything is gassed up, ready to go, and there was just socked in fog in any direction you could go right so the ship's trying to find some open space can't we can't pull it off the flight ops is canceled for that day so now the question is what are we doing with all these topped off jets so you know just inundating flight deck control like hey dog i i've got full airplanes here what do you want me to do are you are you going to defuel all this because if you defuel all of them now it's going to take time away from switching the tanks over to get the stuff uh so, you know, and, you know, defuel chits, you're supposed to take a defuel sample. You're supposed to run through all of the rigmarole of, of doing defuels, and you're talking the entire flight deck. So there was all this back and forth. We're just sitting there just, you know, kind of chuckling, you know, like how much, uh, you know, emphasis that got put on all this and how this is like, what are we going to do? So then we finally get our marching orders. They're going to defuel the drop tanks only. So you can pop the, the lid on the drop tank and just basically suck out all the fuel. It's a, it, it's 
much quicker than trying to defuel an entire airplane. So essentially they just defueled all the drop tanks on like the Hornets, the tankers, the, you know, and, and filled those with the, the biofuel. And that was our great green fleet. So when we launched, you know, and, and I mean, we're talking, there was admirals up in Vultures Row, uh, you know, of all different nationalities. I mean, it was a whole big thing. And I mean, I'm, I don't know if they were briefed on it. I don't know if they were ever made aware. So maybe I just let the cat out of the bag. But the, the Great Green <laughs> Fleet of 2012 yeah. was uh, basically uh, probably 75% uh, regular fuel with That's a funny. little bit of biofuel mixed in there. So yeah. but, I'm sure it, had, uh, it was a great idea that just yeah. uh, sometimes in the execution a little bit is lost. Sure. It's been my experience. So wow. Yeah. That's funny. You know, and... Uh, as stupid as I thought it was, I mean, if these are our marching orders, yeah. I, we, we were all ready and willing to get everything defueled and make it happen. And yep. just, you know, it's just one of those things that, you know, okay, uh, at the end of the day, I just was wanting direction. What are we going to do? Because we've got ourselves a problem here. <laughs> well, you mentioned French fries. Is it when it when you burn it through the engine, mm -hmm. it, it does smell like French fries? It does. Fries? It was, it was like, it was like um, you know. I don't. I don't think it was straight, just no, like fryer grease that they turned in. <laughs> but it did have. It did have just like a smell of just uh, you know, like if you're cooking uh, French fries and like fresh peanut oil. It just there was a definite different smell to it whenever we would. Uh, we we were kind of playing with it at first, but yeah, there was there was that, and then uh, I think that it was that same rim pack. We had our uh, CAG got his thousandth trap. And VFA-154 is the 100 series uh, aircraft. So our CAG jet, the 100 bird, our corrosion had to paint an extra zero. So it was the 1,000 bird. And so they, our, our corrosion was, uh, they, they were not too happy. Working with hard is what yeah, it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, doing anything on the ship, especially with, like, paint, you've got to do a cold work shit. You've got to run it through the fire marshal. You've got to, you know, it's, it's, you've got to plan in advance, probably 48 hours. Cause you've got to run the stuff through, um, hazmat and run, run this through the fire marshal. You've got, it's it just, it's a whole process now, you know, like anything, you know, you think this is like a war fighting vessel, but it, it is, but to get anything like that accomplished, it, it's a process. So that's incredible. makes me think back to world war two, Vietnam, you know, I doubt it was like that. I wonder. But I wasn't there. I don't know anyone that was. But I get the feeling that there was a lot more. Just do what you need to make make the mission happen. Sure. Paint the jet. I mean, literally. But how much corrosion was there? You know, like post yes. post deployment. How yes. much? You know, how many yes. people probably uh, shaved ten years off their life because they're you know, uh, like you why well, all that black stuff you're talking about on your gloves getting into yeah. their their bloodstream or whatnot. Point. You know. So yes. I mean, it's. There's a reason we do the things that we do, even if it doesn't. That's what I try to explain to the students a lot of the time. If there's yeah. a pro process or procedure, this doesn't make sense. Well, do you understand why that exists? And I think a lot of folks, I'll age myself, say so younger folks, but a lot of younger folks, when you explain the reason why, it sticks. It's, oh, yeah, I got it. And I've, at least you know, my mom, a lot of time when I talk to her, she'll talk about, you know, people of her generation, you just, I'm telling you to do it, and you do it. There's not a lot of thinking behind it. And maybe that's a generational shift, but you're not always going to know the reason why. And especially in the right. military, there's not always time to explain. There's not sure. always time to have some big, you know, elaborate discussion. Right. You just got to do it. And you got to trust it. Press that I believe button that hopefully someone did the right thing for the right reason and you're going to make it happen, you know, as There a was, um, I, <clears throat> I told myself uh, as I learned that concept to, um, if, if there was a time-sensitive thing, I, I would tell sailors, go and do this and come find me. We'll talk why. Just, I need it done right now. You know, but... I think saying that, even just saying that, it, it people are going, at least I'm going to understand why. I don't, I may not understand it now, but I was willing to, to, you know, when things settle out, let's, let's, well, we'll, I'll show you, you know, absolutely like the bigger picture of, of why all these things happen. And I think that resonates with a lot of people. It's those little things that you can do, you know, um, it, it's easy to just say, go do it. Cause I said so. And I'm guessing no one taught you that. No one ever told you that was their technique. I'm guessing you probably picked that up because that's how you appreciated it when people treated you that way. It was definitely something that I just kind of trial and error learned. Um, okay. When I when I learned my maintenance controlness, when I was uh, you know it, a young chief watching how uh, some of the maintenance controllers acted at 154, um, I, I thought. You know, because you, you hear about the, the desk chief, the maintenance chief that comes over the counter and, you know, choke holds somebody and, you know, yells and screams and, 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 and 
uh, pounds their chest and, and that's how it's supposed to be done, you know? And you almost get a sense sometimes that that's, that's like leadership. That's what it needs to be done to get the, the job done. And so, you know, when I say there was a lot of regrets, that was one of my big regrets is I kind of took that cue and kind of, uh, thought that's the way to do things. And I learned quickly that like, nobody will work for you in that capacity. You know, um, you're not going to get, you you know, you might get one or two things done at first, you know, just because people are kind of taken aback. But once that becomes the norm, people are just going to shut you off, you know? And so, um, I, I kind of realized that like that's, and one, the other thing too, is I just didn't feel good doing that, acting that way. It just wasn't something that I was like that, that I wouldn't want to be treated that way. Why am I turning around and treating other people that way? You know, just barking orders. And so it was something that I, again, I I made many mistakes and I I learned from them and a lot of self-reflection and and just said, what, what kind of person do I want to be remembered as? Do I want to be that guy that when, when I'm not there, people are like, thank goodness. Or do I want to be that guy that, you know, is like, Hey, we, you know, I learned a lot. I, 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 I miss his calm demeanor on the desk. I, you know, I, so, you know, it's just, it's, I think every leader goes through that. I think if you're truly, um, uh, involved in leadership and want to be a good leader and want, you know, you, you are going to go through those stages. Cause I think everybody, and when you're young, just thinks that's how it needs to be done, you know, and you, you, you do some trial and error and, and you, you, you pick and choose kind of how you lead and, you know, you find what works and, you know, you find what you could weed out. And it's been said many a times, but it's absolutely true. You, you learn a lot, good and bad, depending on you know, from people. So yep. even bad leaders can teach you something because it, you, you know, you can learn how you don't want to be, you know, yes, how you absolutely. do not want to behave. So, uh, well, I love sayings, quotable quotes. Um, what you learn first, you learn best. And so if that's the environment you came up in, that's what you will default to when you are looked upon as a leader. Right. So you have to have that, you know, self-reflection and realize, Hey, was this good or was it bad? Were they doing the right thing for the right reason? Maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, or, uh, another good friend of mine, when I went through my master's program, um, you know, I'm a 20 year old, he's like 50 year old at Arnold air force base, you know, working next door as an engineer. So Tony had teenage kids and he always said, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. The people you're surrounded by, that's who you become either consciously or unconsciously. So if you're surrounded by folks, like you said, that are great leaders, you want to be around them. You want to keep in touch with them. You want to be like them. Right. That's hopefully what you will then become for someone else. But if you don't actively, and, and here's the other thing, right? You don't, you could be around folks that are less than stellar to be around, and you don't have to become like them. It's a choice. Sure. But if you're not thinking about it, it's easy to up, sub, subconsciously slip into that. I say this with all of 31 years of life experience, but sure. <laughs> well, which is none at all. No, that's but. great advice. I, these are like the conversations I'm having with my 19-year-old son right now. Really? Know? Okay. Yes. So, yeah. you know, just trying to, he, he just moved out on his own, and he's experiencing Wonderful. life. And, you know, it's just trying to get him to realize, yeah. you know, kind of what, kind of, you, you, you are kind of, who you hang out with and you, you, yep. the choices that you make are going to affect you. Although you may not realize it right now, these, these things have consequences. So, yeah. um, and it's just, it's really tough, uh, in, in the age that we live in with, uh, you know, he, he's got a, he's just up against the world, you know, and the world is, is coming to him stream through a, a small screen that's in his hand constantly. So, um, there's never really a time to turn it off. It's just, I feel so bad for folks that have only known that, only known social media, only known right. connect. I I do remember, I'm not that old, but I do remember like an actual phone that flipped open, mm-hmm. big old, I mean, it looks like a brick, big old batteries. Yeah. Um, it so, was just a phone. There was no texting. There was no messaging. There was no video, YouTube, podcasts, none of that stuff, music. And I, in some time, again, this is the old man in me. In some ways, it's wonderful. It's an awesome tool. In other ways, I miss, I, I, I appreciate the ability to put it aside Right. And interact with people because there right. are things you would never say to someone in person that some people might feel enabled to say to them online right. or through a different medium. Right. And that makes us all worse people off, for, I People forget think. there's a person on the yeah. other side. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Yeah, it's funny. When I was ship's company and again living on the ship, they were like, you need to have a recall. I'm like, well, my J-Dial, you know, it's the J-Dial is the shipboard phone. You know, okay. they call it a J-Dial. It, 
So I was like, my, my JDAL, that's my, you know, recall. They're like, no, you need to have a number. And I'm like, well, I don't have a number, you know, and this was 2002. So cell phones were a thing, but they weren't as popular as, you know, it wasn't like everybody had a, a cell phone. I'm like, well, we need you to get a cell phone or something. And I can remember thinking, no, <laughs> like, if I'm not here, uh, you know, uh, unless, unless like World War III is about to happen, I'm probably going to be aware, you know, so I'll come back. But out, you know, when I leave the, the, the turnstile of, of the pier here, I'm gone. You know, now nowadays I, I leave, you know, uh, a room and my phone's in the other room and I feel, you know, yeah. like, so it's, it's, it's crazy how it's just switched to like that. And, you know, you, you, they take it even further with like this whole metaverse and people just uh, putting, I don't know if you're familiar with not, no. So, you know, Facebook and, and, and this is all new, I'm probably speaking uh, years behind it, but, you know, Facebook <laughs> has kind of turned themselves into a meta now and uh, they're, yeah. they're trying to do a lot and with like virtual reality and, and they're, they're trying to make it to where you're, you're going to be part of the metaverse, which is now you, you put on a VR headset and you're going to live in the metaverse. You know, you're, you're going to do your virtual shopping through there. You're going to have meetings. So, you know, and, uh, COVID was a huge, um, I think catalyst for, for pushing a lot of this. So like, okay, we all have to quarantine. We all have to sit in our, in our, in our houses, but we still have business to conduct. So you can, you know, drop down a VR headset over your face and now you're, you're in a, in a setting where everybody's there and you can talk and interact and you, you know, you have these meta, uh, avatars that you can become or, you know, they're supposed to represent you. But as we know, it, you, you know, you are not you, it's what you perceive yourself exactly. to be. So yep. you can make yourself to be whatever it is you, you want to be. So good know, or bad. Well, I yeah. mean, it is, it is what it is. Right. Um, I think that we could go on a whole oh, yeah. side topic of, of that kind of stuff, but uh, that that's uh, definitely less aviation and more just. Uh, it is. I will say, hopefully, to button it up, I have faith in humanity that people. I don't want to say resist. That's the wrong word. But people will hopefully realize that's a tool. It's a thing. It's not all encompassing. That's not. If you look back to our history, right? That's not how humans have interacted. Maybe it is the future, but. I don't know. I'm the pessimistic guy here. I see a lot of negatives in that. I don't know that I see a lot of positives. Maybe I'm missing something here. Well, it's because we're old. <laughs> it, <laughs> that's a fair point. Yeah. You know, you, my son who's 12, I mean, he's, uh, that's kind of how I got tuned into it because we were talking about, you know, uh, Bitcoin and, you know, oh, like, yeah. uh, okay. cryptocurrencies and, and, you know, everybody wants that get rich, you know, uh, quick scheme. Yeah. And how do yep. you get in, how do you get in early, in early? And I was telling them, you know, like you, you've got to kind of think about, some of the things that are, uh, you know, kind of uncharted territory that you can, you know, cause when I was in Fallon, Nevada, uh, when I was stationed there, there was an Amazon distribution center that was in, uh, Fernley, which is like between, um, so you, you go, you leave, uh, Fallon, you hit Fernley and then, uh, Reno is, is next up. So you, you basically go through Fernley to get to, uh, Reno from Fallon. And there was an Amazon distribution center there. So this is, 2000 2001 um and i can remember going online and ordering a cd and having it like the next day on base you know delivered on base and uh, and why i never said this is amazing i should invest in this back in 2000 you know it just it's just not something i was thinking about you know so i was trying to explain that to him you know like how you know if i had had the kind of foresight of just how uh, convenient this was and just how awesome this was we'd be you know millionaires right now but we're not so talking to him about these these things you know i said so what do you think is the next big thing and he said virtual reality and i'm thinking okay you've got those oculus headsets you know but when i really started diving into it and looking into like the metaverse and just kind of all the things that they're trying to do i mean there there is a lot uh that is uh i think coming down that you and i might not see the need or necessity for but uh someone like my son who's grown up with a phone in their hand and and interacted with people online no you know you, you we walk outside there's no kids outside playing anymore all the interaction is online you know uh you, you used to be able to drive through neighborhoods and there was gangs of kids you know uh you know, I, I know about me growing up we were playing kickball or we were we were down by the creek or we were you know playing basketball we were you know outside and video games existed and there was you know, times we were inside playing video games, but, you know, we enjoyed being outside, too. We enjoyed uh, one of the, the funnest things I did growing up was on the hot summer nights playing flashlight tag uh, out in the woods. You know, yeah. just we yeah. would we throw on like black, you know, stuff and just get a flashlight and just go run out and, and try to find the best hiding spot and have other people with flashlights uh, trying to trying to find you. And it was just 
I mean, awesome. And now I, I even mentioned that to my son. He was like, that sounds lame. You know, it's just he'd rather uh, uh, be on a video game, which yeah. is which is sad. So, I you agree. know, it, it sounds foreign to me and you about this metaverse. But the you know, when you're when you factor in a lot of just how people have been raised and in, the, in their environment and you, you throw at them like you could at, you could be anything you want. You could, you know, kind of do anything you want with, within this metaverse world. Yeah, it's not real, but what is real? You know, that's like the that's the kind of the question they're asking. Well, what is real? I mean, if I perceive it to be real, if I if I'm living in this world, you know, and and it's what makes you know it's what makes my synapses fire and what makes my endorphins race. What what is real then? I'm you know so I, I don't know. I, I feel like there's going to be a uh, plethora of people with their headsets on in a vegetative state and the barbarians are going to come kicking in the door and, and just <laughs> completely take over and it'll be, we'll just, yes. we'll just restart, you know, uh, society somehow. So in a very strange way to connect the tissue between the two, a lot of, you know, I finished the fit you in what early, late August, early September. Mm -hmm. And so Afghanistan fell to the Taliban, sure. however you want to describe that. Uh, the month of September, I gave that a lot of thought. Um, and, you know, us as a country pulling back in the world, and this is a totally different tangent, but sure. kind of the same point, our adversaries have a vote, you know, yep. other, it's not, we can, we can say, Hey, this is what we as a country, as a society, as a group of people want to do. We don't control it all. And sometimes yep. our environment, you know, I don't know if you want to get even weirder an, a an asteroid coming from space could take us out and there's sure. all sorts of, you know, a pandemic. Uh, there's all sorts of things that we have to we can make all these, you know, grand proclamations and decide this is what we're going to do as a society or as a country, but the adversary has a vote too, and sure. so we have to be ready. For, and again, that's I think the beauty of the military is that, my hopefully, not everyone takes it the same way, not everyone learns the same lessons, but that ability to be mentally flexible. And uh, I, I can't talk about it obviously, but Seer, you know, some of those experiences, right? Greatest experience, greatest military, and I love flight training, so I'm not trying to compare it to flight training, no, but some but of the greatest military training because. I will never forget eating a, a big, as a group, in, in one of our prison cells, a big, t it was like a metal pan with rice mm -hmm. with yellow mustard and anchovies on it. And my dirty hands, scooping it out and eating it and thinking it was the greatest thing I'd ever eaten in my life. <laughs> and I look at that and I, I will occasionally think of that in real life and think, yeah, you, and that, uh, it's training, that's simulated, right? But it was, holy crap, I can stand way more than I think. One of my favorite, qu sure. favorite quotes, you know, uh, whatever thing you might be complaining about, I'm going to butcher it entirely here, but... You know, just say it out loud, and you'll be embarrassed to answer why you can't endure that. I think Marcus Aurelius said that, or something like that. Mm -hmm. I'm, again, I'm butchering it and paraphrasing a little bit too, but yeah, it's a a trained skill, something you have to consciously think about because it's so easy to complain. Ask my wife; I do it all the time about right. little trivial stuff. But then you realize, no man, we're living in the greatest country in the world, some of the greatest opportunities in the world. Sure. Even, and I think that's the beauty of the military too: is traveling overseas and seeing other societies. And I know you've seen way more than I have. I've seen Bahrain. That's oh, it. Man. Which, yeah, the Pearl of the Middle East, of course. Well, that was my first, the first place, or my first port call was Bahrain. Really? So, yep. Where, so, On St. Patrick's Day, 2002. Oh, my. I yep. can only imagine the stories. <laughs> well, it, that day, uh, not a whole lot happened because, you know, at the time I was uh, uh, AT3 and, and my Liberty buddy was an airman. Okay. And we were like one of the last people to get off the ship. Yeah. And at the time, probably a like good thing. Now, Bahrain is uh, pier side. You can get pier side there. They have a carrier pier. At the time, it was Liberty launches. So, you know, you're getting like 40 people off at a time and just rotating these Liberty launches. And, you know, it's all in, you know, all, all officers and uh, chiefs get off first, you know, and you got to wait for all of them. So, by the time I got off the ship, it was pretty much we had time to go drink like two beers. We played a game of bowling, and we had to go back to get in the Liberty Line. So um, that, that was sucks. my first. That was my first uh, import. What uh, time of year? Experience. It was uh, it was St. Patrick's Day, so it was March seventh. March. Okay, so probably not too warm yet. No, it wasn't. It wasn't okay. too. I, I remember it not being as bad. The hottest I've ever experienced was Dubai. Okay. Uh, man, just awful yeah like sitting with those big cool fans that they have and, and they're just blown right on you and it's not helping at all you're just profusely sweating you get a beer and you take two sips and it's like it's hot at that point so it's it was pretty rough in yeah. dubai um yeah bahrain was was i've been to bahrain quite a few times so there's been a couple hot days there the the flight deck is the worst out in there in the in the in the gulf oh my I goodness i can imagine yeah you know just with all the it, just the humidity of the water and then the, 
engine exhaust and whatnot. I mean, it's just miserable. So one of my big, the teaching point I like to make with the, the students, I love that we let them fly with iPads. I get it. It's the way of the future. Sure. Uh, I learned with paper pubs right. and even the 53 would still fly with paper pubs right. and a lot of co-pilots, you know, four flight, awesome tool, break it yep. out, you know, moving map. I mean, you know, it's, it's, uh, you're flying. Uh, you can be, you know, they talk about a Hornet guy being a HUD cripple. You can oh, be yeah. a four-flight cripple. Oh, yeah. And it frustrates me and it worries me because I think at a basic foundational level, yeah, it's primary. Stick with it. Suck it up. Learn how to use the paper pubs. Learn how to manage them in the cockpit. Learn how to have that appreciation for them. In advance, sure, we'll get, we'll get you have the iPad. Or you know what? If you want to pay for it on your own, and that's what I did as a flight student. I learned with it offline, not as part of my formal Navy training. Because what happens in Bahrain when it's 120 and you forgot, you accidentally put the iPad up on the dash and it overheats. It's a brick. Or one of my favorite stories, I was literally sweating so much, I could not it would, use the screen. It wouldn't recognize your finger. It couldn't yeah, swipe. I couldn't yep. even move it. I couldn't even unlock it. Right. It's a brick. Right. And so guess what we did? That greasy nav bag, the co-pilot pulled out to the aircraft. We cracked it open and we made it happen. Now, again, we weren't killing bin Laden. It was pretty benign. It was a training sure. mission. But the point was the lesson was learned to me. You have to have backups. You have to have something to fall back on. So if we don't teach it here at that foundational level, now we're we're uh, we're playing with live ammo when we're doing it for the first time. Yeah. So I, again, I'm, I'm the cranky old man. I'm happy to admit it. My wife reminds me all the time. But well, it's tried and true. You know, like yeah. I said it's it's not going to overheat. It's not going to run out of battery. Um, that was a big thing. Like uh, again, doing the flight training. You know, they, they you're not really you're kind of. Um, they don't want to see you using uh, for flight and an iPad uh, for your private. For instrument, it's a little more, uh, but they still, you know, are, are going to blank it out or, you know, they're, they're, the DPEs can do, yep, do all sorts of stuff. And, and you're right, you know, if you use that as a crutch and it's taken away from you, it's very easy to go, oh, now what? You know, I have not trained for this scenario. So, um, and there are guys that flew, I mean, good Lord, Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic, right? There are people that have done way more impressive things than I've ever done with way less tools and technology. Right. And yeah. They did it just fine. Yep. So, yeah, you have to have that fund foundational skill set. Yeah. I uh, had a story. It was kind of a good segue yeah, into the story. So we were in Fallon, and uh, this was when I was with VFA 154. And, um, you know, it's a lot of just uh, dogfighting stuff that they're doing there, a lot of uh, – uh, we had we actually had three configurations of our airplanes, so you can you know depending on the pylon configuration, we had uh, fighters, strikers, and bombers. So basically, uh, an aircraft that only had uh, the the two and ten pylons, like the outboard pylons, uh, and those were our fighters. And we had the strikers, which kind of were a mix of uh, air to air and air to ground, and then the bombers were just all the pylons and loaded up with bombs. And they were you know building these scenarios where we're launching you know all all the different types out there, and you know they'd have very specific things and. One of the, the uh, you know, systems that is really, I guess, vital is MIDS, right? MIDS, uh, I, I don't know, okay. So I'm it's, familiar. It's, <laughs> it's essentially me. internet in the sky, I would say. Oh, but wow. it's it's, okay. it's so you can create networks, you can link in, you can, uh, you know, um, so there's like, if you have a FLIR image, you can uh, upload that to somebody else, say, here, here's what I'm looking at. Uh, ground forces can, uh, you know, uh, take snapshots of things. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's basically a, a, a communications thing, you know, uh, outside of like IFF or whatnot, you can see all who are kind of linked into the MIDS network and whatnot. So uh, pretty, uh, it's, it's a very, got a very um, uh, potent uh, kind of use in, in war fighting. So um, we, had a, we had an aircraft that had a MIDS problem and um, we, we gave it to uh, an adversary flight, you know, because so we we're like, hey, you know, it's the adversary flight. We don't want to give them all the bells and whistles, but it was an adversary flight with our skipper in it. And so uh, he comes back and he's not very happy about, you know, not having mids because I'm, I'm sure, I don't know if they shot him down or whatever, you know, it, it, it just was not a very good flight for him. And then to find that we knowingly knew there was a mids issue, you know, um, which it's, you know, this is where you get into, it's not a downing discrepancy. MIDS is not critical for flight, you know, but, uh, you know, and so there's it probably. It was in the book, Skipper, did you look? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I took it a step further. I, I made some comment of like, well, you know, I'm sure Chuck Yeager didn't have it, you know, when he was out there fighting uh, bogey. So I'm, I'm sure it'll be just fine, you know, and, and, and he looked at me like, oh, I, I will never forget that look uh, of just like, you know, chief, like, if I could choke slam you right now, I would, you know, and just, I, I, I was like, I should have bitten my tongue, you know, and just, 
read the, read the room and just kind of picked up on the vibe and uh you know just let it be so and i and i didn't i put my foot in my mouth there and uh so be it but uh you know it, it just kind of uh learned that hey you know even even if uh you don't think it's a critical system it's not a downer you know you, you, you deal with a lot of maintenance controllers that are like the mesum says this so you yes. know and and once again having the flight training stuff now you know kind of understanding what these systems do it's like okay i get that you know maybe this comm thing is an up gripe but man that's that's you if you're dealing with a comms issue flying that's not a that's not fun you know yes. it's it's so I get we have a, a me sum and it says that you can fly this, but if you're not at least asking the customer, what, well, what, how is this going to impact you? And is this the right asset for you to have? And you're just, you know, wanting to, you know, pound your, your fist on the desk and say, it's up all day long, fly it. You know, you're, you're just, uh, you're not really putting yourself in the shoes and, and it's hard too. How it's can you, too. how exactly. can you put yep. yourself in the shoes? Uh, when you've never done it. And, and I, I kind of wish that we could do like a uh, introductory flight for Absolutely. all maintenance controllers yes. and let them kind of yes. realize that when you're, when you're up and putting a third dimension on the, you know, cause we're very two dimensional, you know, fast, slow, and then left, right, you know, but then you add that third dimension of up and down, your brain is not, it, it, it just, it's, it takes a while for your brain to process all of that. I mean, it is amazing how much brain power is devoted to keeping an airplane just straight and level yep. and then you start adding you know like uh radio calls and transmissions and like you said charts and you know trying to navigate and you know uh, weather and eps weather and then and now you throw <laughs> a, a, a spotty radio on top yeah. of that where you know you're getting atcs like you know hey uh skyhawk 321 where are you at you know like hey third call you know and you're you're yeah. trying to figure that out i mean there's just it is. It can be a recipe for for some disastrous uh, outcomes, and so uh, I just wish that as 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 a maintenance controller that has seen the other side of the fence, I wish we could incorporate a little more uh, of that. But I mean, how could you possibly do that? You know, uh, incentive flights. I truly believe getting people in the airplane, putting them on the other side of that radio. Yeah, that's where the any time I had the opera, and I didn't have that many unfortunately, but in Bahrain, any time I had the opportunity to take maintainers, our mindmen, our CBs, right. you want to fly? Absolutely. Right. And in their case, they didn't always get to come up to the jump seat. They didn't always get to be up front with us, but they were still in the bird. Mm -hmm. And they got that appreciation for, I hope anyway, how much is going on. They got, you know, get a cool guy photo in front of the bird, you know, turning and everything. We land in Qatar. It looked like we were in the desert because as you know, Bahrain is not the desert. It's a little, sure. a little lush island. So landed LUD, um, you know, get a cool guy photo with the aircraft. Something they could, I, I know plenty of them sent it home, so shared it with family, you know, so they got a Yes, I'm a mineman on a helicopter, which it's hard enough for aviators to understand sometimes. Their families really didn't understand it. Right. So they felt a bit of a tangential, hopefully less than tangential, a direct connection to what the mission was. But then being up there in the bird when we're flying, you're getting covered in hydraulic fluid and it's loud and yeah, it's a lot. It is. And so we're all on the same team. And I hope I hope I feel that. I really do feel that. Even when, you know, an ATC a controller will snip at me or whatever you know we're on the same team solving the problem together it's not this adversarial relationship that right. i think plays really well in social media or seems you know i don't know it seems entertaining but it's not real life and the problem is when it's entertaining it deprograms you and then you believe real life is like that right so that's a whole again whole nother conversation sure. but uh no to answer your question i believe putting people in airplanes like i would take every one of you flying if i could right i, I would and with a smile it would be wonderful it'd be my joy and my privilege uh, we got to fly together in my airplane. Yeah. Like that. And I hope we get to fly together one day in, w you know, with you behind this deck. That'd be so awesome because you learn so much. And you yes. don't realize how much you learn until you just get the opportunity to do it. Right. And you had several incentive flights in your career. Obviously, we haven't even talked about the Blues yet. Did you get anything in the fleet before? Uh, no. Nope. Nothing. The, blue, the Blues is the first time uh, outside of wow. – so I have two cod rides. Yep. So I have one trap and I have one uh, – I've got one cat shot. So, yeah. It's more um, than I have, so that's pretty cool. Um, and – they were completely like almost 10 years apart. So, um, but out, outside of that, I mean, <clears throat> there was, um, there was opportunities. I had an opportunity to write in a uh, Burt for one of the, uh, last Jado takeoffs, wow. um, back when I was, so I was, when I was a crash and salvage, uh, LCPO, um, the Burt boys came over and asked for a checker, uh, airfield flag, orange and white. And they were like, Hey, we need, you know, they're, they're giving us grief because we don't have one of these. Do you have one? I was like, yeah, I got plenty of them. Here you go. And they're like, anything in return? I was like, yeah, Burt ride. And uh, 
it was it was funny because this was uh, probably three or four months before the uh, the air show, and and they you know they just kind of nodded and walked off, and then during the the air show they walked back in and said hey uh someone over here wanted a burt ride you know they gave us a flag and i was like are you, are you serious that was me and they were like like yeah you know just show up here and you know bring your id card and i had uh at the time ia uh the uh what did it stand for not individual individual augmentee, augmentee. Yep. that's what it was yep. individual augmentee was a big thing and we just had somebody come back from an ia and so uh i was like you know what hey man like go here's you know here's all the info go and uh so this ab2 that had just gotten back from an ia i, I he went over and, and took it so i was like oh you know it, it'll come you know it'll come so my first in uh, my first incentive or whatever flight was uh september 11th uh 2019 um when i did a four ride here in uh with the blue angels so yeah, we've we, talked pretty much up to have we gotten right to you the blues yeah as uh we talked about vaq 132 okay and you know that tour was um, it was Exped, like I said. Yep. The, not much. Uh, I, I can't really think of any t- anything that was too crazy. Working with there. the Air Force, that sounds crazy. Yeah, working with the Air Force. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it was cool. I mean, on the on the flip side of that, you know, we got a lot of C seventeen rides, which that's an awesome airplane uh, to get around in. Um, just going to Nellis, you know, uh, we had a skipper that was uh, um, a little bit high maintenance, so whenever we went anywhere. Uh, we were not staying at the uh, the barracks on base. There's no way. So we stayed at the Palms uh, when we were in, in Nellis. I uh, had a great view of uh, the the Vegas Strip because it's yeah. just a, it's, I think it's on like Flamingo Road. It's like just off the Strip um, is is where that's at. But uh, you know, it it's about a 30 minute drive to Nellis. But whatever, that's where we were staying. So um, you know, kind of felt weird. You know, being on government uh, per diem and you know, staying staying there, but. Uh, our admin chief, as much hair as he got to pull out, he made it work, and it was all approved and legit. And uh, same thing when we went to Guam, we we stayed at the Westin, like in downtown. Uh, have you ever, ever been to Guam? Uh, so like Tumon Bay is the kind of the main touristy area. Tumon, I believe that's where it is. But we stayed like right in one of the premier hotels in in downtown uh, Guam there. So it was really nice. So we, we weren't staying in a. a twigs and huts and stuff we were, we were definitely uh it was good living good i living think there. that's the expat life just in general yeah and it, yeah. you know I, I look back and do I, I i go man i did ship's company tour there's times where i was I, I took uh when the ship was in the dry dock um when you're on duty you still stand on uh stay on duty on board the ship and what they did was they had one birthing it was a 200 man birthing at the back end of the ship that they didn't do any work in and so when you're on duty you basically went into the birthing they had, you know, they rotated out sheets and whatnot. So you grabbed a fresh pair of sheets and you just found any old rack that you wanted and you threw a lock on the coffin locker and, and that was your, your uh, bed for the night, you know, and it was absolutely disgusting, gross. So I took my mattress uh, from my from my rack that was in uh, up forward and my chief had a little office and, that had a room kind of below a stairwell that I tucked my mattress in and that's where I slept. For uh, you know, every eight days you had duty. That's that's where I uh, made my uh, made my bed for the whole year we were in the dry dock. So when I look back and and think about all that expat stuff, I'm like, well, you know, I kind of earned it. You know, absolutely. That's, it was. Yes. Uh, I've I've been through a lot. You know, standing <laughs> 12 hours of alert you know, up on the flight deck in Oof. in the middle of the uh, the Gulf. You know, yes. being in 130 degree weather and not launching a single aircraft, just standing up there in, in case we launched. You know, so. Having being the FTC, uh, when we have a no fly day, you you're standing alerts, you know. So and if you're at alert 15 posture, you will be you are at the airplane, you know. Yeah. Um, the only difference between the alert 15 and the seven is you're at the same posture level, but the air crew are actually sitting in the aircraft in the yeah. versus being in the ready room at, at the ready. Wow. So, you know, that's my whole you know my shift uh, was a 12 hour shift, and you. You know, it's a no-fly day. I'd I'd go in early, check my email, send send a you know quick love note home, hey, and then head on up to the roof. And you know, uh, me and the line chief, we'd rotate chow, you know, because someone had to be up there. And, Would know. they launch? Uh, I'll be broadly speaking here. Was that something where the alert birds would get off, airborne oh, often? Yes. Really? Yeah, okay. I've, we launched a couple, uh, quite a few actually. A um, couple, couple fun stories about that. We had a, um, we were just off the coast of like India in that area, like. Um, is that the Indian Sea? It's right there. Like, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, but we were 
in that area, and I'm pretty sure it was a uh, it was a P3. I don't know which country it was, but it was definitely a P3. But it was not of a uh, it was of not one of ours, and so it was heading towards us and uh, not not veering or anything. So we had our we had us on Cat Three, which is uh, the ship layout. If if you're on Cat Three, you can't launch from Cat Four. And so we were sitting there on Cat Three, and the the Marine F-18 was on Cat Four. And they launched us, launched the alert. Uh, so they fire up the engines and uh, getting ready. You know, they're supposed to be up and ready within a minute. And, uh, you know, called up and ready, and they're getting ready to launch them. And uh, we got a FADEC hot. So another thing, the, the FADEC um, is also fuel cooled. They use the fuel. They, they run through that. So, and again, if, if uh, the, the Hornet's very smart, if there's any interruption in fuel flow, then it assumes, it, you know, it doesn't mean the FADEC is actually hot. But it assumes if there's no flow that the FADEC is going to overheat because it's not getting cooling. So, I mean, even though he'd only been up and ready for like about a minute and there's probably no way that FADEC was actually hot, he got a FADEC hot, which per the, the NATOPS is you shut down immediately. So here we are with a launch the alert. He's chopped the throttle, got a completely dead bird, so can't even taxi him out of the way. And we're trying to launch. Uh, the alert, and and now I'm sh- getting screamed at. What in the world is going? Why did he shut down on the freaking cat? You know we can't launch cat fours. Get them out of there. Tell them to to spin up. So I'm trying to like communicate, like like get up and going. And he's like pointing to the natops because not only does it say you know, like immediately kill the engine, it says do not attempt restart for 30 minutes. So it's like you know it's a dead bird. He's it's, done. It's yeah, it's completely yeah. done. And and you know I'm I'm sitting there like I like we don't care at this point you know, start up and get out of the way. You know, is that is that the right call? I don't know, but that's what seems to be the most sense other than, you know, getting a tow, you know, and tractor over and a tow bar and, and trying to, to, to drag them off, you know. So uh, I think I, that's what they ended up doing. They hooked up a, a, a tow bar and a tractor and, and pulled them out of the way. And then, you know, the, the Marine squadron was like, wh- whenever the CAG a maintenance mass chief wanted to get a dig at you, he'd be like, man, you guys are making the Marines look good right now. So to have them launch and, and then, you know, we're getting towed off. It was just like it, it was a little bit defeating. And uh, that P3 kind of buzz came right down and buzzed the fantail with the, you know, they'd always get between, yes. you know, um, and it was like, man, it was like right there. So um, and I, I'm sure I think they said they were just. They just took a bunch of photos and just let them know that we know you're out here, you know yeah. that kind of thing. But uh, it was it was a little uh, kind of defeated to just uh, have have that happen. There was one time where we launched and the air crew came back and we're like, "What'd you intercept?" And they were like, "Oh, it was a C-130 with a bad squawk." So it was one of ours, you yeah. know. So yeah, but, yeah. you know, you're... but it, it's all as important because you don't know, unfortunately, that one time that it's going to be something important, right? So uh, yeah, we did a lot of cat and mouse with Iran uh, mm-hmm. up in the Gulf. You know, yes. there was. Um, a couple times where they had the little Iranian uh, little rib boats that were out Fact there. Fire, and they, yeah. Yep. yep and the 50 cows. And I mean, I'm mm-hmm. looking at them and they're looking back at me and they got guns trained on us. And, you know, it's just like, we know you're here. They know we're there. It's just, yeah. it's, it's. And that know. was the reason we were over there was AMCM, Airborne Mine Countermeasures. You know, they want us to close off the straits. It shuts down, you know, Woods of London is not going to ensure commercial vessels to transit through that if there's mines in the water. Right. We <laughs> I always like to joke the best AMCM airborne mine countermeasures is a Hornet taking out those mines in port. Don't ever don't put them in the water. Don't ever let me get involved. The best yeah. AMCM is preventing them from ever hitting the hitting the ocean because once they're there, it's a terrible nightmare. Hmm. And that's for those smaller countries like Iran. I mean, heck, the Houthis. This is all open source. Like I'm not saying anything secret, but all these other little countries. That's how they can punch above their weight. You know, a five thousand dollar mine can take down literally a supercarrier in the right spot, done the right way. Hmm. So it's unfortunately, you know, it's AMCM doesn't matter until it very much does. And right. thank God it very rarely matters that much. But uh, well, I, I keep I keep hearing rumors that they're keeping the 53 around. They, they you know, like they keep keep saying yeah, they're going to pull sure. the plug, okay. but then it just keeps. Uh, 27, 2027 yeah. is the current Yeah, rumor. but mine countermeasures is, is still an active threat. And it's still something that, you know, it I don't think they have, they don't have anything to fill that role. So they I They do mean, not. Uh, and again, this is not secret, but it, you can look it up online because I saw it open source as well. In the year 2021, a naval mine killed actual human beings. Now, unfortunately, it was a fishing vessel that struck them um, in that part of the world that I deployed to. Mm-hmm. And, you know, unfortunately, innocent civilians died. 
But the point is, mines are still a lethal threat. Yep. Not sexy. It's not exciting. Trust me. Trust me. Right. But yeah, they're, they're still a big deal. Mm-hmm. And there are ways for those countries, or, or frankly, terrorist organizations or other groups, you don't have to be that smart to build one. You don't have to be that smart to employ one. Yeah. And even sometimes just the threat alone, it's enough. Yeah. So it's, again, it helps you realize how tenuous the global supply chain. I think COVID taught us that too. Right. When those ships stop moving, or even now when they're piled up outside the port of, you know, port of Long Beach or whatever, waiting to be offloaded, global or commerce. ransacked on the trains. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Our our supply system is a lot more tenuous than you might believe until you see that. I was, I was listening to someone that uh, was talking about that companies – maybe returning to a more localized supply like you know maybe the factory that's uh you know yeah. 20 states over you know is is not an ideal fit when you're you've got local uh you know maybe something a little more regionalized you know so there may be a return to some of that i think so um so made in america still means something and i think it it can be now now is a time that done the right way because there's a lot of red tape and there's a lot of things that business you know, Megan makes cookies. It's not quite a business business yet. She's working on it. She's doing really great. But you start to realize, I understand why people either A, circumvent the rules, Mm -hmm. or B, just don't even become part of the marketplace. Right. Because we make things tough. But then like we talked about earlier, it's for a reason. It's for safety. It's for health. In in the case of baking things, like there's reasons why. My sister had a small little, uh, she was really into EDM music, kind of like the electronic dance music. And there's a huge scene with that stuff, you know, and they they wear a lot of like uh, bright color stuff and just... I mean, it's it's just a, a thing that I didn't even know it was a thing until yeah, yeah. you know. Me neither. Uh, but so she got into a um, kind of a mark where she was making her own like clothing line and whatnot, and she said, I, "I just can't use. I would love to use Made in America, but financially, it makes no sense. I have to source stuff from China, you know. And it's just we've kind of created a, uh, a a market to where you know they they produce and they they do it cheaply so i mean it's yeah. it's very hard to compete you know when everybody else is doing it so speaking of our greatest adversary in the world yeah. potentially, potentially one or two i don't one know or two, they're, they're, yeah. they're doing their best i mean yeah. the, the the headlines are veering towards russia right now they're building up the the troop presence that is there a good and, point i haven't kept up with that but it's you know and, intra, a, a war this time of year in that part of the world <sighs> yeah nothing good will come of that <laughs> for anyone yeah. i nothing can Nothing, Nothing good comes good of come, war in general. Come, yeah, and yeah. it just uh, just to be clear. Yeah, I saw what what Russia can do though, because when we were in um, we when the Syria stuff was going on, and uh, we were actually out chopping. So I was on the the Nimitz. This was 2013. Okay, and we we were about to out chop from Fifth Fleet to Seventh Fleet like that day, and we got turned around and they put us up in the Red Sea, and we kind of hung out on you know in the Red Sea, and we were uh, we were talking about us doing stuff with uh, Syria and whatnot. And the Russians were, there was a lot of boats out there that were running interference because we were doing flight operations in, in the Red Sea. And, you know, when the, when the carrier is uh, doing recoveries, it's got to stay, you know, a certain course. It's trying to maintain winds. And, you know, uh, and they would purposely get in front of us to make the, the ships veer. And, I mean, it, it's... Um, th- there was that helicopter that uh, crashed uh, because that... Russian ship got in front and they had to do some invasive maneuvering while the the helicopter was basically turning chain down on the fantail and because of the way the maneuvering happened a big wave lapped over the the, the back end of the ship took out the rotors the air the helicopter went kind of cattywampus and flipped over the side and and basically sunk and they never wow. re- recovered the aircraft I mean I'm sure they're they recovered no, no, no I know the they, story I didn't know the backstory so that was the that reason was, why the ship was maneuvering Yes, because that that was it was a little Russian vessel that was out there just playing cat and mouse games with us the whole time we were out there in the Red Sea and uh, wow. the yeah. Um, yeah it's another as a day in maintenance I, I I probably will never forget our our Mo comes running in and said what's the airplane with the best FLIR on it right now because we're about to launch for search and rescue um, you know so like 106 got the best let's go you know like what do you need like because I, I believe it was on a no fly day um, so. Yeah, it was a no fly day. That's why they were doing helicopter ops back and forth to the ship. So they were they were like, uh, you know, looking to unbury it, you know, because whenever whenever you're doing a, a no fly day, they they set the uh, the flight deck up a certain way. So you know, we got everything daily, and we didn't end up uh, launching, but you know, it's just still one of those things that you know. Spool, got... spool X to an extent. It's... Yeah, something we're good. And that at. was a. I don't know if you heard the the whole like the the family found out through Facebook. You know, no, there was. I did not. Yeah, that. that was there That's was terrible. a whole big thing on that. That was just kind of a, a, a gut punch, you know, for that for that whole thing. And uh, 
uh, my wife was one of the ombudsmen's for our squadron. So, I mean, there was just a lot of like, hey, you know, we've got to keep this uh, information sacred and ensure that, you know, there's a process the Navy has. And, um, yeah, but it's pretty sad, pretty sad day, you know. To yes, absolutely. 